tax administration laws amendment bill and uh, the 2020 rates and monetary amounts and amendment of revenue laws bill. So uh, we are going to have uh, to receive submissions from different stakeholders. Uh, we'll try to be strict when it comes to management of time. Uh, every stakeholder will be allocated um, uh, 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, uh, you should have uh, made your submission. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, you have sent us uh, written submissions, which is quite very important. So you don't have to uh, uh, say everything that's contained in your uh, document. You just have to do with the key issues uh, that uh, you want to communicate. Is uh, Madam uh, Younger and Momo here? Yes, chair. You are still using the old computer. Yes, chair. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, you are Tila Ben Tala Ben. You are used to this younger. Hey, it's you who came with these things. So. Uh, Everybody is uh, welcome. The meeting is uh, officially open. Uh, are there apologies? Uh, you said it's Dr. George will leave uh, at some stage. Uh, that's the only apology, Alan. Uh, yes, Chair, that's far. It's only Dr. George indicated he needs to leave at half past 12. Um, since I last indicated which members are present, there is um, Honorable Butelezi of the IFP and uh, Hill Lewis from the DA also joined. Honorable Nkosi Butelez has joined today. Yes, sir, Honorable Chairperson, I've joined today. I always struggle with the network, but yeah. today I think I'm fine. Alan, you must get us a champagne to celebrate. <laughs> 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 you must celebrate uh, today. The Nkosi is here. Thanks very much for joining, Shen. Okay. Uh, before we proceed, uh, Treasury, uh, Yanga Momo, do you want to say something in regard to the bills that are before us here, before I hand over to stakeholders? Uh, I don't know if Momo is there. Momo? Okay, because he was going to join. Uh, but Chair, we just want to say that uh, these tax bills that you are having public hearings today give effect to the budget proposals that were announced in the 2020 budget. And the tax bills were published for public comment on in July, 31 July 2020. And we received public comments. On 9, 10, and 11 of September, we had public workshops on the comments received on the draft tax bills. So today with public comments, and then I think next week we'll be responding to you in terms of the response document on the public comments received today. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, uh, Madam Yanga. Uh, let's proceed. Uh, the first presentation will come from the South Africa Tobacco Transformation Alliance. Uh, it's now five minutes past nine. Uh, so in the next 10 minutes, uh, South African Tobacco Transformation Alliance, uh, you should be done. There is a request that uh, we should uh, open up our videos because uh, uh, the television channel of uh, parliament is uh, broadcasting this uh, meeting. Uh, I understand that those who have got difficulty that uh, when they at the same time uh, open the uh, uh, unmute both the video and the mic, they've got problem with the, the sound uh, quality. Uh, so those of you who don't have problem uh, when you present, 
please unmute uh, both the mic and the video. Uh, uh, over to you, uh, uh, South African Tobacco Association. South Africa Tobacco Transformation Alliance, are you there? Alan, are they connected or do they have a connectivity problem? Um, Chair, the person, um, Ashley Shongo um, from um, the Alliance, is online, so I'm not sure what her issue is. Tobacco Transformation Alliance, can you unmute? Um, thank you very much, Chairperson, for giving us this time to present. Um, Shadrach CBC will be the one presenting. Shadrach, you are muted. Can you please unmute your mic and start the presentation? Uh, Brother Shadrach, what's happening with your connectivity? Madam Longo, are we succeeding with Shadrach? Um, let me let me try him. I think his connectivity is very low. Annalisa, can you can you take over? If in the meantime you can present, he will join you later. Because we don't have much time today. There are twenty presentations uh, before us. Hey, Brother Shadra, we can hear you. Yes, yes, I'm here. We have been waiting for you. Yeah, I had uh, an issue with the uh, connection, but I'm here now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, An apology. You know, okay, you, you have to look at your clock. We'll uh, be very strict with time because we have got 20 presentations. So you have to present for 10 minutes. So you just have to deal with uh, the thrust the main uh, points in regard to your presentation so that i don't cut you short thanks so much yeah. okay over to you brother shadrach uh, tobacco transformation alliance honorable uh, masanga and honorable members thank you for the opportunity to share the views of our organization the south african tobacco transformation alliance SATA, on the taxi administration bill we are the voice of the tobacco industry, and our members employ over 8,000 8, people directly and support the livelihood of more than 30,000 dependents. I am here today to urge you to recognize the plight of our members, the thousands of people who make a living from farming, processing, manufacturing tobacco products and who do so in full compliance with the law. We have met a written submission which outlines our concern, but let me summarize them briefly. We believe there are two ways for government to increase access revenue from the sales of tobacco products. Option one is to act in such a way that encourage increase in legal sale volume which increase the amount of revenue. This will mean keeping the price of tobacco products at an affordable level. Or option two is to increase the access on tobacco products, which in our view will decrease the amount of legal tobacco products being sold and consequently decreases the amount of revenue. It will also we have no doubt open up more and more space for illicit traders. 
we believe that option one, not to increase access on cigarettes to keep the price at a current level, is the best option. We urge you to consider that. SATA, as SATA, we make this point knowing full well that the COVID-19 lockdown opened up a massive space for the already flourishing illicit tobacco sector. Cigarette pi pirates were doing fairly well even before the lockdown, and the ban on legal cigarette sales will, was like a manna from heaven for them. All the available research shows that they made millions of rent from selling illicit products, and the state lost out on millions of rent in access revenue. As we lost out on so much needed income from sale of legal products. We have suffered a hammer blow because of this space that the government created for the illicit sector during the lockdown. In fact, we are being punished for operating in a low bidding taxi compliant way. It would be completely wrong if we were to be hit again because government needs to make up the money that was lost during lockdown. It will be punishing us twice. And we must say, many farmers and processors may go out of business. The total price of tobacco products was to be increased significantly because of another access increase. It is, it is no secret that illicit sector erodes government income. Certain local jobs damages the government's ability to make the necessary investment in infrastructure development to grow the economy. The illicit traders are threatening to wipe out the local leaf pro producing and processing industry, putting thousands of jobs at risk and threatening the livelihood of our dependents in rural communities around South Africa. Illicit tobacco is the enemy, Honorable uh, Maswangani, not those involved in low abiding economic activity. We appeal for a sensible approach when considering the changes to the excess on cigarettes. SATA therefore proposes the following. The government should not increase access on cigarettes because this will lead to a rise in illicit trade and therefore reduce reduced access. Two, national treasure has already gone beyond the 40% access incidentally, as outlined in the access law of South Africa. We recommend that no further increase should be made as it takes us further away from the policy target rather than closer. Three, law enforcement agencies must directly tackle the illicit trade in cigarette, which has heavily impacted on our value chain. We believe that treating this issue with the agency it deserves will surely allow industry to increase sales, therefore increase access and enabling to function as a sustainable economic contributor. Our law enforcement agencies are struggling to cope with the current level of illicit trade and a step which increases the activity of illicit traders will put even more pressure on the state and on law enforcement agencies in particular. I would like to make two other points in conclusion. Firstly, we believe South Africa should employ a minimum retail selling price law, MPL concept, which has been adopted by several other countries. The MPL set a price Below which cigarettes cannot be sold. This makes it easier to identify cigarette pirates and to act against them. It can also be instrumental in, in achieving the related public health objective in connection with the consumption of the tobacco product. We strongly recommend that the Treasury should adopt the MPL concept for cigarette through an amendment in custom and
Brother Shadrach, we can no longer hear you. Madam Long, what uh, it seemed to have a connectivity problem. Can you proceed? You are left with four minutes. Um, Mr. Mutumi, can you please take over from from Mr. CBC? Hello. Can you finalize your presentation? You are left with four minutes. Yes. Uh, I would like to make two, point, two other points in conclusion. Firstly, we believe South Africa should ex employ a minimum rental selling price law, MPL, concept, which has been adopted by several other countries. The MPL set a price below which cigarette cannot be sold. This makes it easier to identify cigarette pirates and to act against them. It can be also in, instrumental in achieving related public object, healthy objective connection with the consumption of tobacco products. We strongly recommend that Treasury should adopt the MPL concept for cigarettes throughout an amendment in the custom and access laws. In particular, we recommend that the MPL price point for a 20, 20 cigarette pack be set at 28 rand, which translates to 140 cents per stick in an informal market. For all retail sales of cigarette, promotional discount should not be permitted below the MPL price point. We further recommend that going forward, the MPL price point should self-adjust by a factor equivalent to access changes annually and together with the budget announcement. The MPL strategy will be supported by a gender and criminal penalty regime, which includes heavy fines, jail term for traders who contravene the law. This will allow law enforcement agents to seize unlawful sales of cigarettes in the most efficient, effective way, based on a clear regulation set in law. Secondly, we submit that government should urgently rectify the World Health Organization protocol on the elimination of illicit tobacco trade. Government signed the protocol in 2013, but it has yet to ratify it, leaving a large amount of space for illicit traders to continue with their un underhand business. We request Parliament support ensuring that the loopholes are closed as quickly as possible by government to rectify the protocol and putting an end to illicit trade. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our views. It is indeed of our of it is in this of the joy of our democracy that we as farmers, processors and manufacturers are able to make an in it will shape the collective destiny of our nation. We appreciate the opportunity and trust that we will bear our input in mind as you continue to discuss this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Swissy, Tobacco uh, Transformation Alliance. Uh, let's invite. Uh, the British America Tobacco South Africa, uh, 10 minutes, it's 22 minutes past now, or so 28 minutes to 10, you should be done. B18. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Honorable Maswanganyi. Um, we had made our submission, so I will not project that and I will not go into the entire submission, so you have a copy of that. I'll just address myself to the salient points that we're making in terms of the bills that are in front of us. And uh, Chair, if you indulge me, I also have some instability with my network, so I may just uh, switch off the camera because it deteriorates after a while. I've been on the call for a bit. So I'll start with my presentation and thank you to the 
committee for allowing us this opportunity to share our views in terms of the uh, bills that were published as per uh, Younger's introduction. So, Chair, as you are aware, uh, COVID-19 severely impacted our economy and uh, South Africa itself was not spared from this. In addition to our sector in particular, we were uh, worstly affected by the extended sales ban on tobacco products, which lasted almost five months. And this, uh, as, as, as expected, uh, severely uh, uh, constrained the duty paid market and led to an increase uh, in the duty non-paid market, meaning the illicit uh, trade that flourished. And please don't take our word for it. This is borne out by evidence of research conducted by the University of Cape Town, which uh, stated in two rounds of research during the sales ban that uh, uh, non-paid, uh, uh, duty non-paid cigarettes grew by an unprecedented 104% during the lockdown period. So the study also concludes that uh, the most popular legal brand in the duty paid market, Peter Stuyvesant, plummeted by an almost 54% uh, uh, share in the market. And uh, currently we estimate that, uh, and based on SARS, that the fiscal year will fall by 32%, while uh, 13.7 billion in excise revenue will be lost to the DNP market in this year alone. As we sit, Mr. Chair, uh, the market is still flooded by a lot of duty non-paid cigarettes that were stockpiled during the sales ban, and uh, they are currently selling at pre-lockdown prices that are below what would be considered a minimal a minimum uh, collectible tax. In other words, they are not paying the levies that are due to the fiscals. At the tax in Daba, which was held last month, uh, Commissioner Kiesweta himself uh, uh, stated that criminal networks of tobacco smugglers that were created uh, following the government's temporary ban on tobacco sales are now embedded in the supply chain and will take us years to reverse the impact of uh, the sales ban. So therefore what we are uh, uh, requesting today, uh, Chair, is that uh, we know that Treasury has over the years always insisted that uh, excise is an effective tool in terms of reducing the incidence of smoking. But what we are saying actually, excise not only contributes towards uh, 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 the, the, fl sorry, the, fl the flourishing of the illicit market. Sorry, Chair, I got distracted a bit there. I've been requested to switch off, switch on my video again. Which this, uh, the uh, excise alone is a blunt instrument in terms of dealing with the sketch of illicit trade. Where we are currently sitting now, we are saying uh, you need a balanced approach in terms of dealing both uh, with uh, the excise gap in terms of collections, whilst at the same time, dealing with the sketch of illicit trade. We need a balanced framework in dealing with the two rather than one over the other. So let me get to our proposals, Chair. What is it that we are proposing in terms of making sure that we have a balanced exercise framework? We have always maintained and we continue to maintain, especially in view of the change economic circumstances in our country, that the cigarette category within the exercise framework cannot continue to carry the revenue generating efforts uh, by the national treasury. Uh, the more excise is increased, the more it creates an incentive for the illicit players to uh, sell at uh, below excise uh, values. At the moment, as we speak, we are looking, as I said, at a market that is sitting with huge stockpiles of illicit products that are already selling below minimum collectible tax. What we focused is that if we take an approach of putting an excise freeze for the next financial year, that will allow the legal volumes to grow by at least 5 billion cigarette sticks in 2021. And to this, excise revenue will consequently grow by an estimated 2.5 billion compared to 2020. And if this approach is accepted, we believe that uh, that will give an opportunity for government to collect more revenue, especially in the deteriorating macroeconomic environment. We further urge government to adhere to its own uh, policy on tobacco products that uh, targets for a 40% excise incidence for the cigarette category, based on the most popular price category. Historically, uh, the National Treasury has a uh, 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 failed to meet its revenue collection targets merely because 
uh, the excise increase has been so high such that a lot of the illicit players have managed to actually capture the, afford the consumers who are not afford affording the higher prices of cigarette products. We therefore say, let's not repeat that mistake again. We are currently sitting at an excise incidence of 41.4%, and we urge Treasury to consider returning to the 40% target. That's proposal number one. The second one, uh, uh, Chair, is more of a correction uh, in terms of what government announced. So Yanga correctly pointed out earlier on that uh, we are commenting on the announcement that we made in the budget in February. The minister then announced that uh, there will be an excise uh, imposition on the tobacco heated product category uh, at a rate of 75% of the cigarette category. So, Chair, the current uh, rate for the cigarette category is uh, around 870 per thousand sticks. What happened subsequently was that the calculation was rather done instead of per stick, it was done on a weighted basis, which effectively meant that uh, only 28% instead of 75% was levied. This amounted to an amount of 244.50 per thousand sticks instead of uh, 652 rands point uh, uh, 50 cents uh, per thousand sticks so there's a huge loss there that the state is not collecting on and we believe that since tobacco heated products contain tobacco and they are tobacco products they should be taxed at the rate that the minister had requested so therefore in terms of the draft rates bill that are in front of us we request that even before we get into the next budget cycle that an, an amendment is made to fix it so that uh, this is aligned with the legislative intent of achieving 75% index of the uh, cigarette category. The third proposal is around pipe tobacco, or uh, loosely translated as your loose tobacco or all your own. It currently constitutes 21% of the cigarette category. We are recommending that actually this should also brought in line with the cigarette category because the risk uh, 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 profile of loose tobacco is the same to that of the cigarette category. And we're proposing a rate of 8,087 rand per kilogram. And then finally, Chair, uh, this has already been touched by the uh, previous speaker. Again, I emphasize that excise alone will not effectively deal with illicit trade. In order for our exercise framework to achieve the desired objectives, it must be supported by a robust uh, uh, enforcement uh, environment, both at factory and retail levels. In this regard, we urge the government to ratify with urgency the WHO illicit trade protocol. This will ensure that South Africa also complies with global standards in relation to enforcement against illicit trade. So therefore, we urge that government should with urgent process in place to ensure that we can eradicate the scourge of illicit trade before, as the commissioner warned, it entrenches itself further. Uh, with those few words, uh, Chair, I'd really like to appreciate uh, you giving us the opportunity to uh, share our uh, submissions in public today. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Mloto, EAT, South Africa. Uh, thanks. Uh, the next presentation will come from uh, Limpopo Tobacco Processors. Uh, over to you, 10 minutes. Um, sorry, Chair, it's Alan. Um, the next one is the Black Tobacco Farmers Association before. Uh, uh, let me see my program. Oh, yeah, you're quite right. No, no. Before Limpopo is the Black uh, Tobacco Farmers Association. Uh, over to you. Who's presenting from uh, Black Tobacco Farmers Association? Uh, Alan, who's supposed to be the present? I think it's uh, Zacharia, uh, person, um, and he is on. Uh, I'll send him a message. 
Brother Zagaria, can you unmute? We can see you on the video, but we uh, can't hear you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Unfortunately, I'm not representing B BTFA. It should be... Um, one of my colleagues who's, who's, who's representing the BTFA. Okay. So they are not yet connected. Okay. okay there's another Jabulani. Um, yeah, Mr. Jabulani should be representing the BTFA. Okay. And I don't see him online, Chair. Jabulani, where are you? Uh, okay, we'll come back to them when they, they are connected. Uh, is Limpopo tobacco processors uh, ready? Yes, Chair. Okay. Uh, you can uh, proceed, uh, Brother Zakaria. You have got 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, for giving us this opportunity as Limpopo tobacco processors and would really appreciate also and thank to the, the standing committee for also allowing us to, to give us our presentation. We are Limpopo tobacco processors. That's a, a company that is um, in South Africa and processing raw leaves of tobacco and procuring those raw leaves from um, the farmers and we pride ourselves chair by saying that we are uh, procuring our leaves locally to um, south african farmers so um having said that chair we have experienced uh, the impact of covid 19 uh, that has affected us um, uh, the company and also our farmers uh, over the, the, the past uh, uh, few months, we have seen, uh, due to the COVID-19, the illicit trade has grown exponentially uh, from 23% to 94%. Thus, um, it has now affected our, our company and um, our farmers. So um, that has also caused us um, to see a decline a decline of 22%, uh, uh, and um, that is taking that is taking our farmers now aback. So I would like to ap uh, appeal, make an appeal from our government that they should also see that because we have seen over a few few years also that um, our uh, farmers, due to this decline, um, uh, they are struggling and struggling to an extent that um, um, we have lost almost 20 farmers that, uh, at, at this stage. And then that translates to 40 hectares lost. And, 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 and then having lost those 40 hectares, it simply means that we also um, are going to experience a decrease to our revenue. So if I can just share this chair, I know that we have made that submission, but um, uh, our farmers, uh, uh, Chair, uh, in 2020, we had the plant plantings of hectares for 3,306 hectares. This is the 2021. The 2021 now has been reduced to 219 hectares. So that, that translates to the job losses that we are going to see and um, and also not only job losses, um, but uh, also the decrease to our revenue. So with that share, we are um, appealing and making our our recommendation that um, as Limpopo tobacco processors, that all the tobacco and tobacco products should be exempted from any increase because we believe that freezing of any increase will help the, lo the, the, the local legal industry to recover from instability and uncertainty that has been caused by the rampant illicit trade and, and uh, the effect of COVID-19. We also warn that any increase in the tobacco excise 
will stimulate the illicit trade in the tobacco product that will ultimately lead to a significant decline in state revenue and cause many job losses. Thus, Chair, um, I think my, my colleagues have alluded to certain uh, um, uh, points. I'm not going to make any duplication on that. So we are also saying that um, this will also, any increased uh, chair will also lead to um, cigarette smuggling that we have seen also in uh, during the, 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 the lockdown and the banning of cigarettes. So we are asking and appealing that at least for our uh, 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 farm, farmers and the company to recover, at least there should be um, a total freezing for the following year on the tax and the an increase on tax on tax. Thus, we want to uh, thank you very much, Chair, for this opportunity and also the standing committee to listen to us. So, in conclusion, we we appeal that we believe that our government prides itself by saying that their government that listened to the pleas of the people. So we are we are pleading and we are asking that please that has to be uh, no increase on. Uh, uh, on, on, on tobacco products. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Zakaria from uh, Limpopo Tobacco Processors for your presentation. Uh, is the Black uh, Tobacco Farmers Association connected now? Uh, Chair, they're still not connected. Okay. Let's proceed to Mr. Philip Morris. Is he connected? Good morning, Chair and the honorable members. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Nitesh Ramji. I represent a company called Philip Morris South Africa. Uh, we are headquartered in Cape Town and we have a factory in Boxburg. We manufacture a number of very well-known South African brands, such as Boxer Pipe Tobacco, BB Pipe Tobacco, Taxi Nasal Snuff. The reason for the presentation today is to speak about heated tobacco products, a new excise that was announced in the budget speech in February that was also referred to in an earlier presentation. I will attempt to, oh, I see the secretary has uploaded the presentation. So if we could go to slide two, please. Thank you. So on this slide, we have what the Minister of Finance announced during the budget speech. A couple of important points to note. It's a new tax and the example of hubbly bubbly or shisha or hookah pipe, or as it's technically known in the tariff tables, water pipe tobacco was made reference to, and also the rate of 75% of that of cigarettes. I think important also lastly to note here is, is that we're not talking about e-cigarettes, that's a different product. We're talking about heated tobacco products, which is a brand new category. So if we can switch to the next slide. What I would like to illustrate here is that water pipe tobacco is an existing category that has been around for a long time. The tariff item and tariff subheading has been on the books for a while. And what can be noted is, is that the rate of duty is per kilogram net, 231 rand 69 cents. And that's because water pipe tobacco is made up of molasses as well as tobacco. So what is excised is only the weight of the tobacco and not the weight of the molasses in that product. When the new tariff subheading and uh, uh, rate of excise duty was announced for heated tobacco products, it was announced at 815 Rand 63 per kilogram, not per kilogram net. And this is the focus of our submission. This is a brand new category that has been created by the World Customs Organization. It's also a category that uh, the South African representatives in Geneva voted in favor of. And the reason for this is, is because these products are different to cigarettes. So a new category was created. Also, I must uh, state that our proposition in the heat tobacco category 
uh, was classified as a modified risk tobacco product by the Food and Drug Administration in July this year in the US. Also a very uh, good and clear indication that these products are different from cigarettes. So if we move on to the third bullet point, we see there, not, not the next slide, but the third bullet point on this slide, we can see that if you take the net value of excise for tobacco, which is contained in cigarettes, you get to a figure of 1,087.50 cents. Thus, by taking 75% of that figure, you get to the number exactly 815 rand 63. So we believe that it was the intention of National Treasury to take 75% of the net excise value of tobacco in cigarettes, and that it is merely a technical error that the word net was not included. And this will make sense of what the minister has said in the budget speech if the word net is included. If we can skip to the next slide. Uh, I would just like to cite the example of the United Kingdom where the same issue came up. Initially, heated tobacco products were based on a gross amount, so the word net was not included, and it was quickly corrected. If we look at the last paragraph there, the explanation is clear. The duty on heated tobacco will be calculated based on the weight of the tobacco, as this will provide flexibility and ensure that the duty will be based on the amount of tobacco in the product rather than the weight of the total capsule. So if the word net is not included, it means all the packaging material surrounding the tobacco will be included in the excisable weight. And this is theoretically not normally the case. Uh, if I were to give a different example for ease of exercise, if it was a liquid, you'd charge excise based per liter. And it wouldn't matter whether that liquid came in a glass bottle, in a plastic bottle, in a sachet, in a wooden barrel, it would be on the common denominator. So by including the word net, we believe that uh, it will clear up the situation. And here's an example of where the same issue occurred in another jurisdiction. If we can skip to the next slide, please. Um, so here is our respectful request that the error is corrected by the insertion of the word net. It will make sense of what the minister has pronounced in the budget speech. It will also allow a consistent approach for any heated tobacco products which enter this brand new category. Uh, we have entered this category and we are still very small in this space. Uh, it's not a massive revenue generator yet, and the situation can be reviewed in time. But for now, what we are saying is, is that to have a level playing field for any participants that enter this category, you have to look at the common denominator because the products in this category are not comparing apples and apples um, like it is for cigarettes. Uh, for example, it can come in a stick form that contains tobacco. It can come in a pod form, similar to what you put into a coffee machine. So there you've got plastic and foil. It can come in a vial where you've got liquid and tobacco. So you should not be paying excise on the extra weight of whatever the vessel is that contains the tobacco. You should be paying excise, in our view, purely on the tobacco content or the tobacco weight. It is also our experience that in every single country, 100% of the countries that we have launched these products in that have the same taxation system as South Africa, all 28 of those countries have done it on a net basis, not on a gross basis. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see all of those countries. So uh, we would be the only country if we do not insert net that has this specific excise system that we have in South Africa uh, that would do it on a different basis. And uh, simply put, uh, contrary to the earlier submission, if the word net is not inserted and we have to go according to the gross weight, we'll actually be paying more than the excise duty for cigarettes. And that won't make sense of what the minister has pronounced uh, during the budget speech. 
So we're merely asking for a technical correction and um, that is my submission for today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Philip Morris. Uh, before we take a discussion, is uh, the Black Tobacco Association here? Because we wanted to finish with the sector of uh, tobacco so that we can go to another sector. Uh, Chairs, Alan, I'm still checking, he's not uh, a participant um, just yet. Uh, maybe uh, Ashley um, from Stata that presented earlier, I know she was also in contact with him. Maybe to indicate that she's had any contact with him. Okay. No, no, we'll allow them to present later. It's not a problem. Uh, let, let, let's take a discussion. Uh, from members in regard to uh, the tobacco sector. Uh, Alan, you will assist me in identifying members who will want to ask questions or make comments. Uh, members, um, that's uh, it's your opportunity now to engage with the tobacco sector. Yeah, I've got uh, Honourable Abram. She's the only one thus far. Okay. Honourable Abram. Yes, sir. Um, yes, go to you. Okay. So, person, um, I, I'd like to, to welcome the submissions and um, I, I would like to start with with Zakaria, uh, because you know, at trying times like this, we have to know what works for our economy, what doesn't. Maybe uh, the Limbobo tobacco processors should should just sh share with us um, if we talk the issues of tobacco, how much does it affect them uh, in terms of the company. Uh, how much? How many workers do they have that will be affected by 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 the the tax rate? And my question really would be to say, where where, where were they when we we're really fighting against the ban of the, the, the of, of 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 cigarettes and legal selling of tobacco? Exactly on the same argument that illicit tobacco would then be flourishing and kill ab abiding uh, tillers of the land, you know? And to what extent will they be affected? And to what extent do they think the living conditions of people employed by the Limpopo would be? You can also help him in answering that question, Chair. Mm -hmm. You should know about it. <laughs> okay. The second, the second one is on the the Philip Morris SA company. I hear that they 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 deal in boxer and BB, and I am wondering how are they ensuring that nothing else gets between the leaves if 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 they get my drift um you know he's talking about water pipe tobacco and it contains molasses and i think that is a healthy option now same question probably uh, that I need answered by Zakaria. How do they make their profits and how much do they prioritize health? And what is the difference between the different pipes that they are proposing in terms of health, in terms of uh, financials, 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Abram. Uh, those are the questions to Philip Morris and uh, 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 Limpopo tobacco uh, processors. Uh, I'm not sure we'll start uh, tobacco processors or uh, Philip Morris, who's ready? I can start, Chair. Okay, uh, Brother Zakaria, over to you. Thanks very much, Chair, for this opportunity again. And um, I would like to respond to uh, the questions that was made by um, um, Honorable over there. Uh, Chair, uh, we've got um, in our company only Limpopo tobacco processors. We've got 400 uh, employees. And within these 400 employees, We've got um, the subsidiary company that is Tobacco Producers Development that has also um, uh, 150 employees. So in total, I'm talking about um, uh, 550 employees that are benefiting from this. But from this number only, most of the employees are seasonal employees. That is why that is why I requested that this should be um, freezed because um, for the main reason that we have now experienced a decline or a decrease from, from, from the demand of, of, of tobacco to our manufacturer. And then this is affecting our, our, our employees, even these seasonal employees, to an extent that um, they are, uh, the period that we normally employ them we have now shortened that, that period. And also, it has also affected uh, our um, uh, farmers because we have seen with this uh, uh, um, uh, 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 period that I've made, just, just mentioned, and also with this decline and, and, and a decrease um, of um, the tobacco that we are um, uh, selling to our, our, our manufacturer. We have, we have seen 20 farmers also being affected. And then you, 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 you'd know that um, on, taking 20 farmers away, that would lead to job losses also to the deep rural areas, to the farm workers. So that is the extent of this, um, uh, uh, um, the impact of this uh, lockdown that it had to our industry and also this illicit, illicit trading. Thus, we are requesting that please, this should be uh, uh, um, zero rated because we believe that we are still going to experience more if, if there is going to be any increase to this. Um, uh, so this is the extent to, 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 to what our members or our employees has been affected. And we believe that we are still going to get more job, lo job losses if there will be another increase. I think I've just uh, um, uh, answered that, Chair. If, if, if not, then I will just uh, have to, if ever there is any question that I've, I've uh, skipped, then you can just let me know. And then my colleagues will also be able to assist. Thank you. OK, Brother Zagaria. Uh, Philip Morris. Thank you, Chair, and to the honorable member for the question. Uh, when it comes to the heated tobacco products that we were referring to in our presentation, as I mentioned, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA in the US has gone through all of our science and evidence and has classified this as a modified risk tobacco product. And we welcome any opportunity to engage with the Department of Health or the members of parliament to take them through uh, this process that we went through in the US and to submit our evidence and our scientific dossier. And uh, our position as a company is clear. We are on a smoke-free journey. And what we are saying to all the people out there in the world is, is that if you haven't started using tobacco products, don't start. If you have, quit. But if you are not going to quit, then move to a better alternative, which is scientifically substantiated as less risky and move down the spectrum of risk. So the proposition which we are talking about is clearly evidence to be less risky, not harmless, but less risky. And that is the position of our company. And that is our approach to tackling the issues in the tobacco space. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Philip Morris. Uh, let's move uh, to the next category of uh, uh, bodies which are here, uh, tax consultants, or tax uh, uh, professionals. Uh, the first will be the smart funder. Uh, is smart funder connected, Alan? Honorable Chair, we are online and happy to present. Okay. Uh, a request that, that you would enable me to share my screen. I think it will be very um, constructive if I could take you through the presentation on my side. I'm not sure who the host of the meeting is. Okay, you can do so. And remember, you have got 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Um, this is a setting that just needs to be changed on Zoom for whoever is the host of the meeting. I see, thank you very much. Host disabled participant screening. It's just a setting that needs to be changed. Um, I see Standing Committee on Finance is the host. I'm not able to share on my side. Sorry, Francis, I didn't know I made you co-host. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, when I click on screen, it still says host disabled participant screen sharing. I think it's a setting. Um, let's see. Did it work now? I think Francois van der Merwe was made the host and not Francois Liebenberg. Sorry. I see I'm still not the host. It's still Francois van der Merwe. Uh, sorry, Francois, um, my screen is frozen for some reason. I'm just trying to sort that out quickly. <laughs> uh, Francois, you can proceed in the meantime because we have copies of your presentation. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Um, I think it will be very constructive if I could share my screen. Um, Francois van der Merwe, if you are able to please make me the host, that would be very good, thank you. I can do that, uh, I just don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, maybe if, if you could give, give Francho guidance on how you did that. Yeah, I'm just trying, if he can, um, let's go into the participants and you'll yes. see if if you just move your cursor over you'll see more and then yeah do it from there because i can't do anything now as i've given switching rights to someone else okay uh so i'm um i'm on more okay my ghost thank you Yes, can you make me host and then I'll make him host? Uh, okay, so if I don't go to Francois Liebenberg, I can find him. Okay, and then more and make host. Let's, uh, see. let's see now. Thank you very much. I'm able to share my screen. Excellent. Can you just confirm that everyone on the screen can see what I see? Okay, it's visible, you Thank can proceed. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. My name is Franco Liebenberg. Um, I'm from a company called Smart Funder. I appreciate we've got a very short space of time, which has been delayed with these technical issues. I promise to keep this as short as I can. Um, my business partner, Henko Viet, is also on the screen. We're both here and actively willing to participate in the conversation around this. Uh, a little bit more on Smart Funder. We are one of the leading bursary administrators in South Africa. We focus on Section 10.1Q of the Tax Act specifically, and that's what, what we are here to discuss today. 
But I think before I dig into this presentation, it will be very prudent for me to give you a background as to why we are doing what we are doing and why we are here. Um, Enku and I both come from lower income households. Um, quality education has literally changed our lives. I'm sure that will be the case for many of the participants on this call, and you can associate with that. Education is such an important issue. And because education has had such a profound impact on our lives, we've dedicated our lives from there on forward to make sure as many South Africans as possible can have access to quality education. Um, so what we are here to discuss today is Section 101Q and the uh, absolute positive impact that it has had. And I want to start off with this because this is so relevant. Education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine, that a child of farm workers can become the president of a great nation. It is what we have, not what we are given, that separates one from another. And that is in the words of the great president and leader, Nelson Mandela. And that sums up Section 101Q perfectly. So what is Section 101Q for the uninformed? Section 101Q is a portion of the Income Tax Act that deals with employer-provided bursaries to relatives of employees. And I want to focus you here on specifically the amazing success that this positive piece of legislation has had. This amazing government initiative has channeled more than 200 million rand towards tens of thousands of employees, learners and students of all levels, and more than 4,000 schools receive money on a monthly basis because of this initiative. And what we are obviously discussing today are both the budget review and, and the TLAB comments. And I want to start with the budget review. The comment that was made in the budget speech was that National Treasury is looking to close a loophole of reclassification of ordinary remuneration to avoid abuse. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are the compliance partner of more than 200 companies. We are very, very passionate about closing things like loopholes and about ensuring compliance in legislation. But as with any new legislation, there's bound to be loopholes. And when this announcement came out, we were absolutely in favor of this and we definitely support firming up of the legislation. So. Just to give everyone on the call uh, an example of what a loophole could be in the system. And that would be the simple reimbursement um, of study fees, which is not covered by the Tax Act. It is disallowed by an interpretation note by SARS, but it's not covered in the Tax Act. So what some companies do practically, they have their employees come at the end of the month and just submit receipts for educational expenses. And then these companies reactively reclassify that receipt that has been brought as non-taxable remuneration and pay it to the employee. That is not a practice we condone. It's a very good example of a loophole. And when the announcement was made, we are absolutely pro firming up legislation and closing loopholes. But as you will all be aware, the announcement that came in the T lab that was published in July is different than what was said in the budget speech. And it looks at closing down this, this um, amazing incentive completely. In the interest of time, I'm going to assume that everyone knows about the announcements and I'll just focus on the two effective takeaway points. The one is that the effective date is for one March and that doesn't completely align with the school year, although it aligns with the tax year, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. And that there's an effective closure of the program completely that the T-Lab suggests. Um, for those of you who didn't attend, there was also a workshop on this, um, uh, which Younger and the team at Treasury hosted, which I have to, um, uh, you know, congratulate and and um, and state uh, for everyone who wasn't there. It was such a vibrant and an open discussion, and I think the spirit of that is exactly why we are here today: is to think, um, put our heads together to firm up this legislation because it is such a massive success, and look for ways that we can improve on this. But as you can imagine, education is a very very emotional issue, and as such. There was vast um, representation by many stakeholders, more than 100 people from industry participated. And as you'll hear today, as these presentations are made, the industry is absolutely of the same mind here. No one in the industry differs. We are all of the same mind that firming up legislation is a very good move, but that taking away the legislation completely will not yield positive results for us. And so this is what I want to leave you as a takeaway there. The two main themes for those that attended was that Treasury is concerned with abuse, firstly, and secondly, with a loss to fiscus. So there are five points that I quickly want to focus on. The first one is, what is the intent of this policy? 
and what is the positive impact that this has had. So in 2006, the T-Lab announcement was that salary sacrifice should be allowed for employer provided bursaries. And they stated that skill shortage in South Africa was the reason why the salary sacrifice is allowed. So T-Lab in their own pen, National Treasury allowed for this, an absolutely forward thinking um, piece of legislation. Now, as a brief um, primer for those who are uninformed, what is salary sacrifice? Salary sacrifice specifically refers to the situation where an employer had, gives the option to an employee to sacrifice a part of their salary so that that portion of the salary that has been sacrificed can be replaced by a bursary for the relatives of, of that employee. And I want to focus your attention on this table here. You'll see that from 2012, up until 2020, there's been an absolute effort from National Treasury, which is great to make this more inclusive for more people. So where we started off with you having to earn less than 100,000, we sit in a situation today where people who earn less than 600,000, now bear in mind, this is not for the rich, it's for the middle class, people who earn 600,000 or less, but it's been made way more inclusive, which is great. Um, and you can do 20,000 per child in school and 60,000 per child in university, which is more than sufficient to cover that. So the question then is, if there's been such a great effort to make this more inclusive and there's such a positive benefit, why do we want to take this away? And on the issue of salary sacrifice, I want to quickly point you to the, the, the stats here. In 2019, um, the loss to duty fiscus is for the 200 plus companies that we are the compliance partner for. Now, bear in mind, these are not small companies. Most of them are JSE listed. It was a mere 11.5 million rand to fiscus. Um, that's not a massive impact and a major loss, and it assisted more than 3,000 learners. And the point here around salary sacrifice is that all of these employers have indicated in a survey that if salary sacrifice is disallowed, which is the proposal in TLAP, that they would no longer be able to, um, to put this forward to employees. And that would effectively mean a closure to the program, and we know at least 8,000 children would be worse off because of this. Point number three, we don't have to touch on. That has been addressed. Point number four is the effective date. As I mentioned earlier, the school year and the tax year is misaligned. And in normal tax legislation, it makes sense to amend um, legislation for a tax year. But if we have this legislation become effective in one March, you may have a situation where child school fees are disrupted halfway through the year. So we think for this specific piece of legislation, it would be more prudent to do any effective changes from 1 January 2022, because it will align very smoothly with the academic year, as opposed to the tax year. Point number five is the final point, and honorable members, this is really what I want to focus on today. Um, as a compliance partner to all of these uh, uh, companies, we have seen firsthand how these companies go above and beyond to ensure compliance. It's not that the companies are not willing to adapt and to ensure compliance. These are two examples of things that the companies we partner with. The one is verification of the educational institution to which the money is paid. The companies do this on an individual basis, which is a lot of effort. And they make sure that the relative is attending this educational institution before money is paid over. And secondly, they facilitate direct payments to the educational institution. So that avoids the loophole that we talked about completely. And these are two great examples of what we can add to firm up the legislation. So with that in mind, when a company is compliant, what do we see? If you follow here, in 2020, for the 200 companies, bear in mind, these are large companies, a mere 8,000 employees are using this benefit. So there's no abuse where vast majorities of people are, are using this. It's only 8,000 employees in 200 companies. Um, Francois. Francois, you are left with three minutes. No problem, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. This is the takeaway, and this is the important thing you, you've got to realize today. We therefore recommend that instead of closing down the whole scheme, that these two requirements, direct payments and vetting of the educational institutions, rather be included as part of the legislation, because not only will this ensure compliance, it will significantly reduce the effort required by SARS to police this, making it the same as medical aid or, or retirement products. Um, We've also seen that 1.36 relative use this. We know the national average is 2.4, so that's lower. More than 90% of these relatives are direct children of the people who use it. So there's no abuse in terms of relatives where this is taking place. And this is the very, very important point, number three. 
The majority of children benefiting from this comes from single mother households, supported by the fact that more than 70% of the people who use this are female, and more than 90% earn less than 450,000. Honorable members, it's the poor, it's single um, uh, mother households, it's female, it's young children that are benefiting this. This is not a scheme for the rich. Um, I quickly want to touch on this. I've mentioned that 74% of the recipients are female, more than 450,000 rand, uh, more than 83% earn less than 450,000 rand. I'm going to conclude soon. There's only one slide after this slide. Please bear with me. This is really important. We know that education is progressive. The recipients of these bursaries are all, the majority of it, grade seven and below. We know it's young children who are the recipients um, of this. We are ensuring the future education for young, vulnerable children with this piece of legislation, which is massively effective. We know the, the, the users of this, this benefit are also young. Um, and so to, to, to conclude, and this is the summary, and you've got to excuse me, I know I get really passionate about this, but this is such an emotive thing and so important. And, and this is a, 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 an issue we just cannot, cannot leave alone. In summary, where does this leave and us? Both to recommendations, Francois, Perfect. so that I don't, I don't fight. That. I'm, I'm, I'm concluding. From our presentation today, um, as, as we'll all agree, this incentive has been an amazing success. I think it's, it's very evident from what I've presented. It has become more inclusive and the benefits um, the vulnerable members of society at single moms and young children. The proposed legislation in TLAB will however close down this incentive completely. And this will reverse all of the positive work which has been done since 2006. We know at least 8,000 children will be worse off if we do this. The two main issues that we've raised in the workshop are abuse and a loss to fiscus. From what we've presented today, the simple addition of two measures, which are direct payment to schools and a required verification of the educational institutions can solve the issue around abuse. And we've seen the loss to fiscus is low. So I conclude with this, therefore, we plead with all stakeholders that instead of closing down this whole incentive, that legislation is rather firmed up to ensure compliance and allow for the continuous of this massively effective piece of legislation, which secures better education for those who need it most. Honorable members, ultimately, this is not only about the bottom line, because when it comes to children, we do and we should think twice. Thank you very much, Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, thanks, uh, Francois from uh, Smart Founder. Uh, the next presentation will come from uh, South African Institute of uh, Tax Professionals. Over to you, uh, Tax Professionals. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. I think we've had some trouble with that. We're just going to wait for, I think, for Alan to, to share from his side or alternatively, for Francois to share to myself. Francois, if you can share to Beatrice on. Yeah, Beatrice, I have made Alan the host again. I see Alan okay, has made the co-host. Maybe, Alan, if you could just make Beatrice the host. That will thank enable. you so much. Okay. I have Thanks. received. Thank you so much. I will do so. Just a moment. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Honourable Chair, is, is my presentation visible? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. Um, we've had a great interaction with both SARS and National Treasury on these matters. And although we've sent all our presentations, which, which I think is eight in total, so there's a, quite a lot of reading matter, we only work through the highlights for today. Um, the the highlights are set out. There's basically eight matters that we need to discuss today. The first item I saw is uh, the Council of Minerals is on the schedule for later today, as well as um, I think some of the, the other entities, um, uh, RCBs, that will also be addressing the matter. But the, spe the specific matter that I would like to address today, and, and we only give our view to it and then to be, I suppose, expanded upon by our colleagues, is the proposal not to allow contract miners to utilize the, the mining capital expenditure. So to give a brief summary, um, when you have a mining capital expenditure in a wholesale mining operation, you get a special 
tax dispensation. And the tax dispensation is such a way because of the heavy capital expenditure that you have within a mining operation. Other sections within the, the Income Tax Act allows you uh, a five-year period to claim your capital expenditure. So it's, it's quite a big benefit if you give it to a specific entity. Now, from our side, and I think there are some ag agreements and disagreements on this, we agree that contract mining should be distinguished from whole-scale mining in the sense that if you are a contract miner and you are therefore subcontracted to do a part or provide a service to a whole scale mining operation, you should not necessarily get the same tax treatment for the expenses that you create and the capital expenditure that you've got. Now, from that perspective, the, the point is that how do you then ex distinguish your capital uh, or your contract mining from your whole scale mining? And the way that National Treasury is proposing to distinguish that is to say that the way, the way that you should look at it from a mining perspective is if you've got the mining right, you will be viewed as conducting whole scale mining. However, from our perspective, that is not how the facts work from the Minerals Council from South, of, of South Africa have approved and they've granted mining rights in a variety of cases for whole scale mining purposes where the mining operation itself, the, the structure thereof, does not include the mineral rights sitting with necessarily with the person who's going to have the capital expenditure. So to equate the mining operation and whole scale mining and only to see that as valid and proper when you have the mining right, in our view, is, is not the correct premise to use. And the reason why you cannot equate it, the reason why they don't work together, is because foreign inward investment and, and sometimes slow rights transfer, your BE investors, require that on occasion you've got a full structure of, of different companies invested in a full-scale mining operation where one of the parties, or for example, the joint venture holds the license also mineral, mineral right. And in that particular case, to, de to determine who will get the capital expenditure um, based on who holds the mining right will actually not give uh, credence to what's actually happening in practice. So what we're recommending from our side is that, sorry, let me just move back a step. What uh, we're recommending from our side is just to postpone and to liaise with uh, the Mineral Rights Council and the Department of Mineral Resources to find a way forward on this, and then specifically to find a way to distinguish your contract mining on the one side and your whole scale mining on the other side. So that concludes on that point. Then specifically when we look at uh, the retirement incentive regime, I think this is uh, of particular importance currently because um, I don't know uh, of the people, uh, the rest of the people on the in the meeting, but I am seeing at least one, two, three colleagues exiting the country on a monthly basis. And that is in the tax industry only. So when we look at people exiting South Africa, what are the things that concerns us? So when we look at our retirement incentive regime, how it works currently is that it was created to make sure that people who save in South Africa have enough money to retire. That's the premise of it. And that means that government incentivizes people via tax break to make sure that they contribute to retirement funds. The corollary of that is I can't take my money out of the fund until the point when I retire. And that makes 100% sense because only at that point would I need the money. However, that presupposes that I'm going to retire in South Africa. The point is in some instances, people do not retire in South Africa. So if a person doesn't retire in South Africa, that means there's no reason to prevent them from accessing their retirement funds. And currently how it works is because of the fact that there's this convenient exchange control uh, test that you look at when a person immigrates, the test that has been used is to make sure that once this, the, the SARP decides that a person is fully immigrating and SARS gives a tax clearance, the person can take their money from a retirement fund. There's, however, no 100% test to make sure that they won't come back and retire in South Africa. There is no test today and there won't be any test in any time in the future. 
So the question is then, now that exchange control is going, what do we do? Well, we need a new test. And what National Treasury has proposed is that when a member ceases to be a South African tax resident and they remain non-tax resident for at least cons three consecutive years or longer, they may take their money from the retirement fund. So the reason for this new test is basically because the old test is, is no longer going to be used because exchange control is, 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 is ending. In our view, putting an additional three consecutive years or longer on top of a person ceasing to be residents, a resident is unnecessary. And mainly for the following reasons. When you cease to be to be a South African tax resident, it's a it's a big process. You have uh, Section 9 Cap H um, capital gains tax that accrue to you in terms of there's a deemed disposal of all your all your capital assets. Um, there's an existing process on SARS site that's already encoded in law. You're checked by SARS, and it's not more onerous than the immigration test. So to our mind, adding that three-year rule, it's unnecessary. It will be immensely costly from an administrative perspective, and it will have a further negative impact on South African companies continuing to put money, and this is the critical point, I think, from a policy and also a political point of view. It'll have a negative effect on South African companies continuing to put money into South African retirement funds, which is something that we need to do in South Africa to keep on with savings, to keep on with investment. So from our point of view, we recommend that seizing tax residency by whatever means necessary is sufficient and should be sufficient for the person then to be able to access their uh, retirement interest from a retirement fund as long as that ceasing to be tax residents is accepted by SARS because once that happens it is then recorded and because the entire process lies with SARS from an administrative perspective you have everything under control so the opportunity for abuse is a lot lower. Then I would like to go to the next point, which is limiting rollover relief for certain unbundling transactions. Uh, I gave a, a fairly brief example of an unbundling transaction where basically one resident company, which is the unbundling company, holds shares in another resident company, which is the unbundled company. And that, that uh, the company then distributes those shares to the shareholder, to the shareholders of the unbundling company along with the effective interest. Of the shareholders. So basically one company becomes two companies. If you if you want to put that way, I'm a shareholder, I hold one company who holds another company. Eventually I'm a shareholder who holds shares in two companies. The rollover relief is that the transfer from a from a tax perspective, there's basically rollover relief so that there's no additional tax cost on the transfers that take place between uh, the initial company who's the shareholder and the eventual shareholders. Now that makes all makes sense if you consider how business works and sometimes companies need to split up, et cetera, in order for investment purposes. Now from an anti-avoidance perspective, the tax relief should not apply if the shareholders are not in the tax net because they're exempt or they're foreign shareholders, so they don't pay tax. And our biggest concern on this particular item is the bulk of, sorry, let me just go back, the bulk of the, the listed companies are owned by retirement funds in South Africa, including the PIC. And when we look at exempt entities, that includes currently also retirement funds, even though retirement funds aren't 100% exempt because even though the entity is exempt, the eventual payout is taxable in the hands of the people that have put the money there. So basically you and me. So in that sense, it's not like a club where the money that comes in is always tax exempt. Eventually the funds in the retirement fund will be taxed. So our recommendation in this particular item is that any change that should be made here should exclude the holdings of retirement funds in listed companies so that they are not uh, unfairly prejudiced as a result of this particular rule. Furthermore, we recommend that the change be made effective from a future date because there are currently transactions in the making that will be affected by this, and that's critical. Then I would like to go to REITs and uh, the doubtful debt provisions from, I'll keep on moving this item, uh, the doubtful debts from unpaid business leases. Now REITs for those uh, oh, who don't with them. 
Remember, you don't have all the time. There are 20 presenters today, so it's not like other days. Uh, you are left with three minutes. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, so, REITs, I will just go through very quickly. Um, on REITs, uh, their real estate investment trust, the big item with, with them currently is they are in under a severe lot of pressure and the doubtful debt provision is set for one uh, it's set for one January 2021 we request that relief be provided earlier and it's critical because the losses that they are suffering are currently it is now so it's essential from that perspective that the current losses be taken into account specifically for this provision for the doubtful debts then on read carvebacks um the stated concern under the potential mismatch of uh, exempt taxable amounts from offshore that may be indirectly transmitted as deductible qualifying payments. Our big request here is we recommend that in order to ensure that there's a fair regime and that to balance the scales that government deal with the anomalies that will follow, as well as the current anomalies and the mismatch at the same time. Because otherwise, if this carve back and, and this item is implemented now, the scale will be massively stacked against REACH, which just as we discussed previously is already in a, in a bad situation. Then clarifying the scope of transfer pricing rules very quickly. Our view is section 31 should only apply if CF income, CFC income is at stake and at no other points. Section 31 is extremely costly to implement massive administrative burden. So from that perspective, to, to require that administrative burden before even determining whether CFC income is at stake does not make sense. Uh, then the removal of the requirement of willfulness from statutory offenses. I know that our colleagues from SICA is going to deal with this extensively. I will leave that then to, to them to deal with because I think my main point on this is an item that is not in the T-Lab. However, when we look at what we discussed around COVID earlier, countries around the world have been relaxing their rules around tax residency due to COVID. And they've been looking at items such as Section 1010 and that for a number of months already. We're now in October and a lot of people working in and out of South Africa still don't have tax certainty in the current year of what they should be doing from their tax perspective. Although last time we said that we will be providing tax certainty and there's a possibility that this matter could be dealt with um, upon assessment, People are currently living with this uncertainty. So we're requesting that, as I think Moma said at the, at the last hearings, that it might be possible to put in a draft, a second round on the, on the draft T-Lab to make sure that this matter is addressed. And we, we humbly request, and we've had so many people um, requesting that, please, could there be a certainty provided around this just so that they could determine how COVID will affect them further and how it will affect their livelihood because they don't have tax certainty and they cannot wait for assessment to get that. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Honourable Chair, much appreciated. I hope I've stayed within the time limits. No, you have gone beyond by five minutes, Bit. <laughs> okay. Apologies, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, Th thanks, uh, Institute of Tax Professionals. Uh, PwC, over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to confirm if uh, Alan has got us got our slides, and we'll be sharing those. Uh, yes, I will. Can I just ask Beatrice to take off her presentation? Okay, you can proceed with the presentation. We can see the slide. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, by way of introduction, uh, my name is uh, Kyle Mandy. I'm the tax policy leader for PwC. Um, Ellen, if I can ask you to, to, to move to the, the next slide, please. Okay, they, they are, well, just to, to clarify, first of all, we, we've made a written submission which uh, covers a number of areas, um, both the, some of which uh, um, are, are covered by what I'm going to present on today. Um, but uh, those are what we consider to, to be the key areas uh, that we would like members to apply their minds to. Those are not the only issues that we have um, with the bill, um, but those are the ones that uh, we, we would request that the, the committee uh, as, uh, considers and so on. For purposes of this presentation, there are just two issues that I want to, to highlight. Uh, which I believe are the, the more important ones that we need to, to be focusing on. Um, and those relate to the proposals around uh, unbinding transactions um, and around the uh, mining capital expenditure, some of which um, site has already touched on already. And then if you can move to the next slide, please. So to start off with the, with the unbinding transactions, um, the first issue, that, that I just need to highlight and just to, to bring to the attention of members is what, what is meant by an unbinding transaction. Um, and that is, an, in essence, it's a situation where a company holds shares in another company and distributes those, those shares to its shareholders. Um, what I'll highlight though, um, insofar as our concerns are, uh, in relation to the proposals, they are essentially limited to the situation where it is a listed company that is unbundling shares, as opposed to the situation that's also catered for by section 46, which is where uh, shares are unbundled within a group of companies. So it is the listed situation where we have particular concerns with the proposals that are contained in the TLA. What does section 46 actually do? Well, in essence, it allows for shares in an in a unbundled company or so-called unbundled company to be distributed to the shareholders of the unbundling company on a tax neutral basis. Uh, the tax consequences that would otherwise normally flow from that would result in significant, uh, potentially significant CGT for the unbund, unbundling company, uh, as well as a dividends tax liability for the unbundling company and the incurral of securities transfer tax um, by effectively by the, the shareholders of the unbundling company um, in the absence of the relief that is provided by section 46. So in, in essence, what section 46 does is allow that to be done in a tax neutral manner um, without those taxes being incurred. Um, and importantly, without any sort of step up in the tax cost of the shares in the unbundling in the unbundled company uh, or in the unbundling company for that matter, it's a far shareholders are concerned. So essentially, it is just a rollover uh, that, that takes place from a tax perspective in, in that situation. If you can move to the next slide, please. What is important that we need to, to highlight, and this is particularly pertinent in the context of, of listed companies, um, is how important unabandoning transactions are and the relief associated with section 46 is in, in the context of the South African economy. Um, as I've already highlighted, uh, what section 46 does is allow those unbinding transactions to be done on a tax neutral basis. In the absence of that, most unbinding transactions, if not all in the context of listed companies would just be far too expensive uh, to, to implement bearing in mind that we are talking about a cashless transaction. What I mean by that is, I mean that there's no consideration that the unbundling company re receives in relation to um, uh, an unbundling of an, un uh, an unbundling transaction. Um, it is simply a distribution uh, in the same way as any normal div uh, dividend is a distribution uh, of those shares in the unbundled unbundled company. Um, why, why do companies, and particularly, again, particularly listed companies, um, undertake unbundling transactions? Well, what I will emphasize is that I've never come across an unbundling transaction uh, that is being driven by 
uh, for, for tax purposes at all, or in fact, where there's any tax motive behind it whatsoever. What they're designed to do is essentially unlock value or achieve a number of commercial benefits, including unlocking value for, for shareholders, deconcentrating ownership um, in, um, in, in uh, monopolies or oligopolies uh, insofar as um, the ownership in, in underlying entities is concerned. Um, it, it allows for, for more focused growth strategies. Uh, it allows for different investment profiles to, to be separated and, and, and to give uh, in, investors, read shareholders, um, direct exposure to, 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 uh, to, to investments that, uh, that yield specific and, and potentially very different uh, risk profiles from an investment perspective, and also it potentially improves the competitors in the economy by di diversifying ownership um, in a particular sector, um, which as you would be aware, is one of the, the key key concerns in, in the, with regards to high concentration in the South African economy. Um, so the bottom line is that these unbundling transactions are, are fundamentally important um, for the efficient and effective functioning of the markets in the South African economy as a whole. And it's important to bear those, those, um, those issues in, the, uh, in, in, in mind with, as we go through this. Next slide, please. So currently, I mean, there, there are some rules to, to, to protect the South African tax base uh, from any potential erosion in, in in that tax base as a that tax base as a result of uh, unbundling transactions. Um, that, however, that, that erosion of tax base can only effectively happen in very narrow circumstances. Um, and that is essentially where a transaction or an unbundling transaction is driven by a, a shareholder that has the, the ability to, to effectively uh, make an unbundling happen. Um, and that will only be happen where that shareholder is essentially in, has the intention of, of, of disposing of, um, of that shareholding in that unbundled company post the unbundling transaction. And yeah, of course, we, in this context, what we're talking about is a, an exempt shareholder is able to drive that transaction uh, and not uh, the situation where it's a, a taxable shareholder. Um, however, that is only a, a very narrow circumstances and I've never come across that in, in, in practice whatsoever. Um, under ordinary circumstances, though, there's absolutely no erosion of the tax base that takes, that takes place um, for a few reasons. One is that there's actually no value that's transferred to, uh, to any exempt shareholder as a result of an unbundling transaction. All that happens in, uh, from a practical point of view is that a shareholder's investment in the, the unbundling company is essentially split then between the a shareholding in the unbundling company and a shareholding in the unbundled company post the unbundling transaction that takes place. Um, there's absolutely no increase in value as a general proposition that would take place for, for shareholders and there's no transfer um, of value um, from those underlying companies uh, to, to shareholders. All that essentially happens is that, as I say, is that that value is split between the two companies. Um, Importantly, the tax base of the unbundled company and the unbundling company remain completely un unaffected by the, the unbundling transaction itself, and they remain wholly within the South African tax net. Um, what the, the, the existing limiting rule does, though, is it does provide that uh, the relief will not apply where a exempt shareholder, essentially what's referred to as a disqualified person in the legislation, holds uh, 20 percent or more of the shares in the unbundling company uh, post the unbundling transaction and that is done uh, that is measured together with any connected person in relation to um, uh, that disqualified person um, what is a disqualified disqualified person well in, in essence it is uh, it is a, a person that is exempt from tax and that the the most, in the context of listed companies, the, the most important disqualified persons to, to consider are, are non-residents um, and, and retirement funds, but that's not an exhaustive list. There are other um, uh, uh, disqualified persons in addition to those. Okay, next slide, please. So what is the concern of National Treasury? Well, 
well, that is not entirely clear to us, um, but what it appears to be is that there's a perceived uh, has an increase in the use of unbundlings ostensibly to erode the South African tax base. Uh, um, as I said, as I said earlier, I've never come across any transaction that has been designed to, to erode the South African tax base when it comes to unbundlings at all. Um, but there are then, uh, it, um, as I say, existing rules in place, which in principle should adequate, adequately protect the South African tax base in the event. But that aside, what is the Treasury proposed to do? Well, they proposed to, to remove the reference to connected person in the existing uh, limiting rule. And in essence, what will that, that will do is mean that every disqualified person um, will count towards the 20%, regardless of the size of their shareholding and regardless of whether or not they are connected persons in relation to each other. Uh, and that has particular implications, which we'll come to in a moment. Next slide, please. So what are the problems um, with the proposal? Well, the first problem, again, in the context of listed companies is that between non-residents and retirement funds, some 61% of the JSE uh, is owned by those disqualified persons in isolation. So it's pretty obvious that um, the effect of the proposed amendment is that essentially and effectively it uh, means that no unbinding transactions could, could be undertaken by, uh, by, by listed companies as, as we sit at this point in time. Uh, for the simple reason that that 20% threshold will almost by default uh, be, be, uh, be exceeded um, in the context of, of, of listed companies. There are also certain practical considerations that need to be taken into account when it comes to listed companies as well. Um, the first thing is that you need to bear in mind that um, for the most part, shareholders in listed com companies are held through intermediaries such as, uh, as brokers. So at any point in time, it is largely impossible for a listed company to identify its shareholders, certainly all its shareholders, and, and even more difficult to then identify the tax status of those individual shareholders. Um, add to that that the shareholding of a listed company changes regularly, if not on a daily basis. Um, and and, and, and that it takes um, a significant amount of time for, for any listed company to actually implement uh, a proposed and binding transaction. Next slide, please. To, to add to, to the woes of the proposal um, is that the rule as it currently stands is an all or nothing rule. In other words, if that 20% threshold is breached, um, then the no, there's no absolutely no relief in terms of the unbinding transaction whatsoever, notwithstanding that you know, up to up to 80% of the, the shareholding in the unbundled company could be transferred to, to shareholders um, that are not disqualified persons. Um, that said, introducing a pro rata rule, which is one of the one of the um, possibilities that has been bandied about, uh, would not, in our view, um, you know, remedy the, the inherent problems in this legislation. The, the last problem that I wish to highlight is the effective date. So the proposed effective date um, is the date that the draft bill was published for, for comment. Um, so given all of what I've said before, in effect, as we sit, um, any unbundings by, by listed companies have come to a grinding halt. Um, and that is by any stretch of the imagination, not an ideal situation that we need to, that, that, that we should be facing. So it's our view that uh, as an urgent basis, um, you know, th this, uh, uh, there needs to be attention given to that to, in order to allow um, you know, the, the markets to continue operating in, in, in an effective and efficient manner. So when it comes to what, what our recommendations are, well, our primary recommendation is that this proposal should be withdrawn in its entirety. We should stick with the, the current rule as it stands in our view. It does provide uh, sufficient protection for any um, potential erosion of the tax base as it currently stands. 
But as an alternative, um, we, we should be looking at a combination of things um, to, to provide or to mitigate some of the problems. One, is, as, a, as I've already mentioned, is allowing for pro-rata relief, uh, but bearing in mind that that creates additional problems and distortions as well. Um, but we should also look to, to, to narrow the definition of a disqualified per person, uh, specifically in our view, to, to exclude retirement funds. Why do we say that? Well, the reality is that from in all practical effect is that retirement funds, while technically exempt, are not really exempt. It is nothing more than a deferral of the taxation consequences when it comes to retirement funds, bearing in mind that uh, withdrawals from those funds, either in the form of lump sums and annuities, fall wholly within the South African tax net. Um, so they're not, they, they cannot be equated with the with other disqualified persons which are, are, are fully exempt, if you like. Um, and the third thing, which is not on the slide, is, is the Combined, that, combined with this is the introduction of a, of a de minimis rule for measurement towards the 20% the, the threshold. Um, bearing in mind that at best, it's only possible for, for listed companies to identify, uh, identify the, the, and, and determine the tax status of, of, of relatively significant share, uh, shareholders as opposed to, to all shareholders holding any number of, or any proportion of shares in the company itself. Uh, next slide, please. Can you uh, the, the, move the, Hello, Mr. Mendy. Can you move towards conclusion? Yes, uh, Chair, I will uh, be very brief on, the, on this next point. Um, so the, the next one re refers to, to, to mining capex. Um, I'm conscious that uh, SART has uh, already addressed this to some extent, and I'm also conscious that I'm pretty sure the Minerals Council will address this in, in, in significant detail. Uh, at a later stage. Um, I, I don't uh, propose to go through the detail of the proposal, site have already uh, touched on that, um, but if we can then just move to, to, uh, to, to the next slide, please. Um, so just to, to highlight some of the concerns that come with that proposal, um, the, the first one is that, um, in principle, it shouldn't matter who incurs expenditure, incurs the capital expenditure and obtains the deduction in relation to, to the mining capex. Um, what is important, the most important issue, is that that capital expenditure is being incurred uh, for, for mining purposes. And that, to our mind, is the easily major consideration that needs to be borne in mind. Um, um, it's also important to bear in mind um, that holders of mining rights um, often employ contract miners to, to mine those, uh, those resources on their behalf. Um, this is a particular case when it comes to junior miners um, who in many respects don't necessarily have the, the resources and the capacity to mine those, uh, those minerals um, of, um, of their own accord without using uh, the expertise of contract miners. Um, it also needs to be carefully considered as to whether or we, we need to be cautious of making piecemeal changes to, to the mining tax regime, which have unintended consequences on the, on the industry as a whole. Um, these proposals, as they currently stand, um, run a significant risk of destabilizing the, uh, the mining industry, impacting on, on investment and the growth of that industry as well. Um, and it's an industry which is important to, to future growth and we need to be very cautious of, of, of making any sort of knee-jerk changes to, to legislation when it comes to, to, to this industry. Um, importantly, it also needs to be borne in mind, and the site did touch on this, that the proposal to, to limit the deduction for capital expenditures to holders of mining rights um, extends far beyond um, impacting only contract miners. Um, there are, are various scenarios, some of which are listed here on the slide, which I do not intend to go through, uh, where, um, if you like, are not contract miners, but uh, uh, situations where um, um, those who are carrying on mining operations could also be significantly impacted um, by, by this proposal. Next slide, please. And uh, Chair, this is my last slide, and so I'm conscious of time. Um, 
Our primary recommendation in relation to this is that the proposal at this stage, at least in any event, should be withdrawn um, for further consultation. Uh, in particular, um, it is our recommendation, it comes back to the previous point around making peaceful changes, that uh, we should not be making isolated changes such as this too to the legislation. We need to look at the entire mining income tax regime as a whole, uh, and that requires significant and substantial further consultation, uh, particularly uh, with the industry itself. Um, and we need to be conscious of, of, of the, as I mentioned earlier, of the, of the particular impact that this proposal could have, a destabilizing impact it could have on, on the industry. I'll stop there, Chen. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, PWC. Uh, let's move to South African Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants. Thank you, Chen. Peter will start. Here we go. Good morning, Chen, honorable members. We'll just get Alan, just to put up the slides, and you can give us control and we can start. Chair, this is the introduction while we, we will go through the introductions while we wait for the, the slides to come up. Um, there we go. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, together with me, I'm Peter Fowler from SICA. Together with me, Dr. Sharon Smolders. Um, Honorable Chair and members of the Standing Committee, we'll go through three areas today, just look at some of the matters we believe to be policy changes. We look some, at some technical amendments and on some administrative amendments. And under the policy changes, I'll just discuss the first matter before Dr. Smolders goes on and then and with the rest of the, the presentation. So Chair, we've already, from my previous colleagues, noted the proposal on removing of willful conduct or essentially the requirement of intention for criminal offences in the Tax Administration Act. And the reason given for this proposal is apparently that the National Prosecuting Authority seems to find it very difficult to convict people of criminal offences or tax offences and the question then requires, but what does this actually mean in, in the broader sense and within the South African constitutional sense when we make proposals like, like this? So there are three interrelated matters to this. One is just the intention and the constitutional requirements in South Africa. And you'll note uh, on the, probably from the sponsors from both SARS and Treasury, as well as those that they held at the workshops with the public, is that they were doing a lot of international comparatives and we'll just have a comment on that. And looking at the problem of minor administrative compliance as criminal offences and the impact of this. And then the last is something which point we've raised before in this house is the problem of selective prosecution and the dangers thereof as the current law has it, but it will even become worse going forward. And I think all these discussion proposals, Chair and Honourable Members, is not so we can make it more easier for criminals to get away with tax or any other types of criminal offences. It's actually to enhance SARS's ability etc and make it more easy for them to do so but to do so within the constitutional mandate of doing so so when we look at the first provision and requirement chair as i said there's a lot of comparative discussion on this case in, in other jurisdictions like canada australia uh, especially on strict liability or where there's no form of culpa or, or oh, no, I shall have a bit of <laughs> Oh, I judge that so much. Okay. Um, to just proceed on that matter, um, I see there was somebody on, on, not on mute. Um, so in our law, honorable members, the constitutional court in respect of what the requirement is as to the mens rea or the culpability, the standard in the common law as confirmed and the law society made a similar submission to national treasury on this basis is that the standard probably is intention so in our law from a constitution 
Peter, you are mute for some reason. Okay. There we go. Am I back? You back? Thank you. Um, Chair, so the, the point I was making that the law in, in our law requires that oh. contention for a standard proposition. Chair, mute, my chair, uh, no, I'll just proceed on that side. No, you can proceed, uh, Fabo. Yes, sir. I just heard there was communication in the background from yourself, sir. But to proceed, once again, this is standard in the law, and, and a lot of justification in the limitation clause in section 36, etc., to deviate from this principle would be required. Um, the second matter is the issue of the gravity. And when you actually go through some of the transgressions in the current section 234, you'll find that there's a lot of minor issues, things like, for example, not changing your address with SARS being criminalized, etc. And a review of that is probably quite necessary to align punishment to veracity, to categorize offenses and ensure that the only the most heinous of transgressions actually do form criminal offenses. And in this, from the workshops discussed with SARS, where they have struggled, and they'll make this point that there are, on the administrative side, people who just continue to be non-compliant, well, then maybe it is possible to introduce something like a three strikes rule, et cetera, where you have repetitive offenders uh, from an administrative side. But the standard proposition should not be criminalizing people for not changing their addresses and actually focusing. And once again, focusing SARS's attention to the most um, important types of offenses, like all other types of commercial crimes. Chair, the, the last point on this, um, before I hand over to Dr. Smolders, is the issue of selective prosecution. Now, what we will note, now, what is selective prosecution? Well, this is where you aren't treating everybody the same. So where you, there's a discretion. And when we raised this a few years ago, it was noted that SARS doesn't always do this, and it was actually raised in the workshops that this um, prosecutional discretion or prosecutorial discretion was actually given to SARS by Parliament. Um, so that's why we raised it again that Parliament then review this. And the reason why is that when we currently have a scenario where you have three different people who've committed the exact same criminal offence, what the section currently allows is that SARS can decide not to prosecute at all, to administer a civil penalty or to actually criminally prosecute. Now, that is quite problematic when you have the exact same facts. And you'll see this is actually from a constitutional perspective when we deal with similar matters under the National Prosecuting Authority in the Constitution. There, the Constitution compels the MPA to have a reasonable standard of proof where beyond it must prosecute. So there's a compulsion. And that is captured within the public prosecutorial policy and the standard of proof is reasonable prospect of successful conviction. So once you have that, the discretion starts falling away. So you have an objective test. And that is our recommendation is that we do not have a statutory discretion for SARS, but a compulsion. And that compulsion triggers in with a standard, a standard that we hope that Parliament will prescribe. And this means that things like HSBC, Panama Papers, corruption cases, etc. Um, we, for example, have noted to SARS and Treasury an ETI abuse scheme together with other RCBs lately and members can ask them as to their steps taken in that but that's exactly one of these the same is there should be a compulsion there should not be a discretion in this regard uh, so that we make sure that once we've cleared out the, the transgressions to make sure that the actual criminal offenses are there they should just be uh, once that objective standard is met there should be prosecution from that. And we hope that uh, Parliament will be reviewing this to ensure that we do assist SARS in doing so, but give them the best framework within the current constitutional mandate. I'll then hand over to Dr. Smolders to continue. Thank, thank you, Peter. Um, 
Okay, I see the slides going off. Let's see if we can see my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes ma'am. Great, yes, thank you. Thank you. You are left with three minutes, uh, Dr. Smith. Yes, thank you. I'm just admitting a few people here, I see. All right, to move on to the next point, um, which Beatri has already touched on, it's the withdrawal of the retirement funds on immigration. So basically what National Treasury now wants to do is to say that you, if you do immigrate, you now cannot yes, take your retirement. <laughs> you cannot take your retirement funds with you. Uh, you have to wait three uh, tax years before you can actually take it out. Now, our concern basically with that, um, there we go, is that first of all, this is not aligned to the normal tax provisions in the Act. So if you look at Section 9H, as soon as you are deemed to not be a resident, you automatically have a tax exit charge that you have to pay, same within the DTA, even with the definition of a resident, non-resident, it's an immediate tax effect. There is no waiting uh, for three years before you can do that. So not only is this not aligned with the rest of the the tax act sections, but it is also treating different funds differently. For instance, your pension fund and your provident fund, you can access those when you actually uh, uh, resign from your employment. Um, preservation funds, you have one chance to, to take the money out, but with retirement annuity funds, you have no option to get that money out. So we are now here treating funds differently. And I, this will also cause financial hardships for those that have immigrated and that are waiting for all those planning to immigrate and, and need those funds to set up homes somewhere else. And as, as Beatri did mention, the tax would have already been paid on this and these people will not be relying on the government to fund them should they retire subsequently. So our request here is to align it with the other provisional uh, sections in the Act so that the tax incidence is immediate and they should be allowed to take their funds out. And we move on to the Section 1010 exemption, which Beatri also touched on. Um, again, here we have a concern. Um, she said she had a lot of phone calls. We also had frantic phone calls. If you looked at the news on Tuesday, um, you will see that Emirates stopped their flights to South Africa because of the quarantine rules for their staff and they didn't have enough staff to fund it. People were desperate to get out of this 183-day rule. They were trying to fly to Namibia just to get out of the country to ensure that there wasn't tax issues for them um, because they couldn't get to the destinations where they wanted to go to because of the lockdown. Um, so really coming here, and, and the other concern that we have is that a lot of these taxpayers um, did not pay uh, provisional tax in August, assuming that they would be out of the country by, by October and that they would have been within the 183 days. And now with the cancellations of flights, some of them are sitting in this and they will now be subject to interest and penalties because of that. So we do urge the government to please have a look at this and provide temporary um, COVID relief measures for these individuals as, has, as the OECD and ATAP have all recommended. We're also on contract mining, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but the Atri and Carl touched, touched on this. There's major concerns here, far-reaching industries, and we do welcome National Treasury's willingness to consult with the industry um, on this, as was mentioned in the workshops. And, and our suggestion here is that we do consider the Davis Tax Committee recommendations as well as Carl did allude to. If we move on to the more technical changes, there's four of them that I want to discuss, but basically all of these have some tax implications with the tax individuals either land up paying more than they should have um, normally, or there's double taxation, et cetera. If we look at the loop structures, so that's basically where a South African is now investing in a foreign country, in a controlled foreign company, who then invests back into South Africa. So they want to change the tax implications for the dividends and capital gains in those respects that it now becomes taxable. So the concerns we have here is that the whole purpose behind Section 9D was to put the person in the same situation as if they had invested directly in South Africa. What these amendments are going to be doing is resulting in the fact that they are not in the same position as if they were investing in South Africa. In fact, they will be worse off. Um, and that relates to the dividend and both the capital gains. And we do say, let's just get them into the position that they would have had they invested uh, in South Africa directly, we cannot uh, make it more detrimental to them in this regard. The other one is the company ceasing to be a tax resident. In that case, they are now saying that if the company ceases to be a tax resident, the shareholder in that company will now be deemed to have a disposal of those shares, and they would have to pay tax on that disposal. Now, the concern that we have here is that this is economic double taxation. Um, so the company, when it all ceases to be a tax resident, has an automatic tax charge. 
on the assets in that company. So it is double, why we mean economic double taxation, it's not only the company paying the tax on this, they're now wanting the individual shareholder to pay the tax on this as well. And, and we don't feel that is right. It, it's, it's just can't be. And there are, the South African resident will be in the tax net in any case um, when they sell those shares. Same with the transfer of listing of uh, shares and moving that across to a foreign stock exchange. Here again, there is no disposal. Uh, there's no really um, avoidance measure here. The person hasn't sold the shares. So how are they now going to get the cash to actually pay the tax that they want to, that, that National Treasury wants them to pay when there's been no disposal of that particular share. So again, we recommend that that proposal be withdrawn. Moving to the unbundling transactions. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on this. Carl has spent a, a lot of time on this and we confer, uh, concur both with him and with Beatri on this. Our biggest concern, obviously, with this is the effective date um, and that that be moved out because at the moment it's going backwards and we want it to go from a future date. Um, from either the time that the bill is signed or any further future date and later date would be recommendable because this is going to be catching, should it go ahead, it's going to be catching legitimate transactions, um, not to mention all the other concerns that, that Carl did mention previously. From an administrative perspective, one of the concerns that we do have is that um, the uh, National Treasury now wants SARS to be able to uh, provide an estimated assessment should a taxpayer not provide the required information when requested. So if you do it once and you don't provide it, they want to issue an, an estimated assessment. Now our concern with this is, and, and it has been discussed in the courts quite recently, where um, we are saying that this is fine, but the concern is, is that a lot of taxpayers don't actually receive the first request. Although so I'll say it has been put on the e-filing profile um, or the e-filing uh, system, a lot of taxpayers can't actually see that, and it's been shown that you know, it might be on the system, but the taxpayer can't see it. And that's been two recent cases on that. Um, so we do urge SARS to, or National Treasury, to, to implement the draft rules in terms or regulations in terms of Section 255 of the Tax Administration Act, so that any communication must be done using multiple channels. So providing at least the latest email address to provide that notification. And in that case, we've got no problem with the proposed amendment. And that's it from our side. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Peter and uh, Dr. Smulders. Uh, let's move to SA Institute of uh, Professional Accountants. Yep. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I think, in, in, and I see we, we, in terms of time, don't have a, a lot of time available. So I'm going to just limit what we discussed because uh, my colleagues, uh, from the uh, state, uh, SICA and PwC, I think have addressed a lot of the issues quite extensively. What I would like to perhaps uh, from our side, the first point that we really want to emphasize is with regards to the limitation of being able to have access to your retirement funding uh, and the three proposed three year rule. And for us, the, the, the key issue here, uh, and as it's been stated also uh, by my colleagues, is that there's a distinction between a person being uh, deemed a non-resident or becoming a non-resident from a tax point in South Africa, but with the intent to return to South Africa, versus one who uh, is legitimately immigrating or with no intent to return. And uh, waiting three years has not only limiting the availability of those funds for setup needed in the other country, uh, what I'd like to do is just highlight that if we just look at three of the major currencies, you look at the euro, the pound, and the, and the dollar, uh, over the last three years, we uh, th those currencies has, has seen a devaluation, or South Africa's currency has seen a devaluation of between 23 and 28% against all of those currencies year on year. You, you see a constant devaluation or, or reduction in its value. Now, for a party to wait for three years to access those funds will have an, an enormous uh, impact financially for if, if that kind of devaluation continues, not uh, set aside that they don't have access to those funds uh, right from the beginning. And uh, as it was mentioned, and I think it was said that it's in their presentation referenced that what one of the th reasons or primary purposes of uh, encouraging a person to, to, uh, to, to save for retirement funding is so that you're not a burden on others or the state now, when you are immigrating without the intent of returning to South Africa, you're no longer uh, a burden, a potential future burden to South Africa. Um, 
so that person needs access to those funds sooner than later. But the, the key here would be the distinction between a person who becomes a non-resident purely, let's say, for instance, the tiebreaker provisions in, in a treaty, but they intend to retain their presence or, or their residence back in South Africa at the end of their wandering versus a person who is left South Africa without the intent of returning. Uh, we, we need to make that distinction and we can't just rely purely on, on the, the standard tax rule. Uh, there needs to be some form of declaration or process that is incorporated where a person declares their intent uh, up front and on that basis allows them access to those funds versus the three-year rule. Uh, because in fundamental, we don't have a problem with the three-year rule if a person intends to come back or uncertain about their, their permanence of leaving South Africa. But to uh, a party who is clear to, to immigrate from South Africa to restrict their access for a further three years uh, uh, is fraught with problems. And, and I'm not going to reiterate the, the items already addressed by my colleagues. Um, the next major item that we uh, also, and, and although it has been addressed by my colleagues, uh, we do believe that this is significant enough that we uh, still reference this. And this is regarding uh, the, uh, the scope or the criminal offences uh, in terms of non-compliance in terms of the Tax Administrations Act provision or the, the changes that is that has been proposed. Um, and I'm not going to reiterate what's already been said. Uh, and, and we full heartedly agree with, with our colleagues on, on, on their presentation. I think one other thing for us to perhaps just take into consideration in uh, when you look at our submissions is that there are many tools available to SARS in collecting taxes and criminalizing more of those or pursuing more of those from a criminal point of view is it has a, a massive knock-on effect not only on our courts but the cost of litigation and and defending oneself uh, not everyone has access to those uh, and and the the professional repercussions they could have i mean many professional designations is on the basis of that you do not have a criminal record uh, your ability to immigrate to uh, some even certain countries your ability to get a visa to travel to that country is dependent on uh, whether or not you have a clean criminal record so to go and criminalize tax matters uh, that is not not at that significant nature that requires criminality such as fraud is is quite appalling to us and and i think the the channels that are still there uh, if we take an example the administrative penalties could be taken far bro broader scope in, in terms of uh, currently the legislation actually will allow for uh, SARS to apply um, administrative penalties for a person uh, failing to update their address with SARS but yet that's not being applied. We're only applying those penalties on things such as outstanding tax returns. So there are other avenues available that SARS should first use and uh, utilize before we go down this road. And I think in, in closing as well is uh, one thing that we, we cannot dismiss is that the morality of the taxpayer is at an all time low. And one of the issues of morality as well is how do you feel, you, not only how your taxes are being spent and collected, but administratively how the taxes are, are being dealt with. So when you've got a taxpayer generally trying to be compliant, trying to do the right thing, but keep on getting punished and because they're the known party, it does not bode well for, for uh, improving tax morality where there are a number of other more serious tax offences or parties getting away with tax positions that is not necessarily being, being um, seen to be, be brought to book. Now, I mean, SARS has done great work in, in, in of recent, and, and we see constantly uh, everything from arrest to, to uh, action being taken, and, and that's great. But we do feel that the current taxpayer needs to needs to feel that there's a balance of uh, the rights that they have and the amount of action SARS could take, or at least the, the defense that they could hold against that. And, and I would say that you know the Ombud has already called for things such as the taxpayer rights. Um, 
do, do go and further strengthen SARS's position and to, to expand the scope of actions being taken, whether SARS pursues those or not is, is, uh, is not as relevant as the taxpayer's perception as to what SARS could do versus the rights the taxpayer has. And I also think that uh, one of the other things and, and, and I think Kyle mentioned that is that there is a uh, almost a selective process as to who we will pursue. There has to be a, a general consensus by people that all taxpayers will be treated the same. And before we start uh, messing around with the provisions that are already in law, especially around criminality, I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Etienne Retif from uh, SA Institute of uh, Professional Accountants. Uh, honorable members, those were the presentations uh, from the tax industry. Uh, can we engage comments, questions for clarity? Alan, you will assist me in uh, identifying members from your side. From the screen, I don't see any hand. Osana, Chairperson. Okay. So it means uh, we can uh, proceed. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tax Industry. Uh, uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, I've got uh, Osana and Dion George. Uh, how do you see them? Because I can't see them in the platform where they're supposed to raise hands. Oh, no, the, uh, their hands are raised in the platform. Uh -huh. I can't see them yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Skosan, is your video working today? Uh, no, it's still a challenge, on our chair. There's a network challenge. But for now, we a player for eight. Uh, next time, was oh. more next time. Proceed. Yeah, no, no, no. Thanks, chair, and and greetings to everybody. Uh, no, we welcome the presentations uh, by different uh, presenters. Uh, on 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 the issue of uh, catching up the the retirement fund. Uh, I've heard uh, from the South African Institute for Professional Accountants and the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants and the South African Institute of Tax Professionals. I think they are all I think, uh, talking the same language in relation to the issue of the three-year waiting period that if a person is immigrating, uh, can't immediately uh, cash his or her retirement funds, uh, there should be a waiting period of about three years. So they are arguing against that uh, uh, based on the fact that uh, when that particular person must go establish himself or herself wherever he or he is going, he would uh, need those particular funds. And uh, well, they are also making a point to say that uh, it's not everybody who immigrate who will come back later. There are people who might immigrate, they may not come back later, so they may not be a burden of the state. They may not come back to South Africa and be a burden to the state. Now, one well, the difficulty that I'm having is on the fact that how are we going to distinguish between these two different people? Because a person may immigrate and say, no, I'm not coming back, uh, I'm going to reside somewhere else uh, internationally but after a few years that person decides to come back and uh, if that person comes back obviously he or she is going to be a burden to the state uh, 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 because i don't think we can only uh, conclude to say if a, if a person tells us i don't know i'm not coming back that's why i need my money i can't wait for three years but if, if in the process after two years or three years the person decides to come back and he or uh, she has cash up all uh, retirement funds and he has finished those funds now coming back that person will obviously be a burden of the state so i'm just having a difficulty there to say how are we going to manage that thing to say if a person says no 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 i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm i won't come back but 
at that phase and end up coming back to South Africa. Well, the second point, which is also the last point, on the issue of criminalizing tax matters, I think the SICA and the South African Institute of Professional Accountants, I think they both raised the issue of other tax matters that have been criminalized in their view. They don't think they should be criminalized. For instance, they make an example of if a person, if a taxpayer did not update his or her address, maybe he's using a new address, but uh, he or she failed to update that. Uh, well, we know that it might happen that a person erroneously uh, 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 or forgot to, to, to make such updates, and it would be unfortunate to criminalize that kind of a person. But there would be people also deliberately, uh, because of sinister motives, who may opt not to update uh, uh, their change of address because of sinister motives. So I think handling this matter, I think we have to find a balance uh, because you can't treat all these people uh, the same and say, no, no, uh, uh, it's erroneously or they just forgot, but because they could be at some point sinister motives for, for people not to do that. So to criminalize it, I think it's on the basis of the fact to avoid such sinister motives and other things. But obviously, I don't think it would, if they say it's been criminalized, that the person would get the heavy sentence for not having updated that address. I mean, it's not, in my view, it won't be a serious crime, but it is a crime. So uh, we'll have to find a balance, because if we say, okay, it's not a criminal offense to do that, you might find everybody not uh, updating their address, because it's not a serious thing, it's not a criminal offense not to do it. And we find people who've got sinister motives, they will be able to thrive because of that. So I don't know maybe how they think we will be able to manage and deal away with sinister motive associated with that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Kosala. Dr. George. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Honorable Skosana actually touched on the issue that I was going to raise regarding the issue of access to retirement funds on immigration. Um, but one of the um, issues he did not um, cover was that um, it's, I mean, certainly clear from our side is that the three year waiting period isn't workable for many for reasons put by the industry. It creates enormous amount of hardship for people who have chosen to take a particular um, direction um, to their lives. Um, but my question to the presenters would be, um, have they made any counter proposal? Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. George. Uh, do we still have more hands, Alan? No, Chair. Uh, it's only Etienne Retief that raises and um, assuming he wants to answer the question. Okay. Uh, Etienne, can you respond to the questions that have been raised? Even the other uh, professionals, your colleagues, can respond to the questions. Thank you. Uh, I think, first of all, just to deal with the retirement uh, funding question, there's no guarantee that a person makes a false declaration or perhaps has the intent to, to leave South Africa permanently uh, to find greener pastures somewhere else. And then after a few years, uh, whether it be not being able to obtain permanent residency or whatever the case is, might return to South Africa and that risk is there. But with all due respect, that risk already stands under the current provisions we have. Remember, these are new provisions that put in restrictions. So um, we're not asking for, for, for things that is in, entitles a person to something greater than that they had already. The, the new restriction just now puts everyone into a position of saying, as regardless of whether your intent is to return to South Africa or not, you've got to wait three years. Um, and, and that creates the hardship. Now, in terms of proposal of how to address it, I mean, there is two things that, that one can deal with. One is if a person returns to South Africa within three years, uh, is that they could be forced to, to repatriate um, the, the remaining funds that they have, assuming that there are funds like that available. Uh, but the more so, the, the question of that declaration 
is not just one of me saying, filling in a form and ticking a box and saying this, I'm going to leave. Whenever we, we look at these things, and, and I would suggest that one looks to the tiebreaker type provisions we already have within treaties. And within those tiebreaker provisions and what most of the countries look at when, when we, we kind of look at this kind of question is they refer to a thing called your, your uh, place of vital interest. So I'll use an example. If I go and I go to Spain, and I'm going to stay there for an extended period of time. But my wife, my kids, my dog, uh, everything stays back in South Africa. My point of vital interest is still, in fact, South Africa. If I uproot my family, I take my wife, my kids, uh, my dog, we go all to Spain. Uh, I sell my business in South Africa. Uh, I, my kids go to school now in Spain. My point of vital interest has shifted to Spain. So I think if one has to look at that declaration of immigration or intent is linked to one providing uh, support that you are shifting your, your uh, point of vital interest or the place of vital interest to another jurisdiction, I think you will address with uh, probably 95% of the risk of a person making some kind of false declaration just to access their funds. Uh, because the cost and the effort involved in being able to do so is so significant, it's highly unlikely a person will go through those kind of steps and those kind of costs and efforts purely to access some retirement funds without it being a legitimate intent for a person to actually immigrate. Um, so I think that will talk to the intent and, and the, their intention to, to permanently immigrate, um, uh, which will address that three-year. Because we don't have a problem with the three-year rule in other circumstances, because that's a nice clawback. It's only where a person does not intend to return back to South Africa, where the three-year rule creates hardship, which is what we think should be addressed here, instead of a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. And then the, the second question, just with regards to criminality, uh, things like the addresses, bearing in mind that we, we've already had the Tax Administrations Act for years already in place. It, this is not a, 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 a trying to, to change, SARS is trying to criminalize certain or make it easier to criminally uh, pursue matters which are um, currently difficult for them to pursue that way. And we're saying this, well, we're not trying to make it difficult to pursue someone criminally. We're just trying to say is you should not be pursuing someone criminally unless it is necessary and all avenues have been exhausted first. Um, and that that burden of criminality should stay as it is. We, it should, there should be a burden um, to prove criminality. The, uh, and, and things like address, and, and, and let's just be honest, the amount of data that SARS has got available uh, in the new digital age and the amount of third party data that SARS has access to today compared to years in the past is significantly different. If you look at the every financial institution has to submit records on a, at least an annual basis to SARS that has that record in it. SARS has access to ask for that. Uh, there's the employer who um, buy annually and annually have to submit uh, employees tax certificates that includes addresses and banking details. There's, so for SARS to, to validate and being able to get access to multiple channels to alternative information about a taxpayer if they really wanted to pursue them is there. So I don't think a taxpayer will just avoid their liability because they don't update their or uh, misrepresent their, their address. Yes, it might frustrate uh, the, the process and it might take a little bit more effort to, to, to pursue the taxpayer. But in all due respect, that's the taxpayer that you want to pursue not the taxpayer who erroneously didn't update their details. I can tell you from experience um, of many occasions where uh, the taxpayer has thought that they have updated their, their information, but because there's three different channels where you have to update your information, and even within a company, there's different tax types that you each have to update. It's it's very easy to drop the ball there. And then we're now saying as we're going to criminally prosecute because you, you perhaps weren't aware, you made a mistake. And the challenge that I put to, to even to SARS is before we go to this, SARS right through before the start of filing season for 
at least two months, were very active on social media platforms and, and various channels to inform you of things like the uh, auto assessment and, and those kind of processes. And I went back to it. I couldn't find a single post in social media or in advertising that was done by SARS in those two months to actually say, taxpayer, please make sure your details are up to date. So there's so many other channels that first could be pursued by positively reinforcing advertising, uh, educating some taxpayers as to what they should do before we start going after them more aggressively. And, and, and I think that's our approach is that those avenues must first be explored and first be used exhaustively before you start changing law to more aggressively and criminally prosecute uh, or criminally pursue persons. Because also remember when I do an application such as a visa application, one of the questions on there is not just do you have a criminal record, it's are you aware of any criminal ac uh, uh, action being taken against you? So even just the pursuance of a criminal action against the taxpayer, whether it's successful or not, could actually make it difficult for me to just travel, let alone seek immigration. Um, uh, if I look at a lot of boards of directors and that, because of governance, will actually do background checks on the directors before they, they appoint it in those positions. And having a criminal record for something like not updating your address as a taxpayer because your tax practitioner might have dropped the ball or you changed practitioners or you forgot or whatever the case is, is it's not a it's not a good outcome. And that's okay. why we we, we Etienne, thank you. Etienne, we know you are very passionate about your profession. Mm -hmm. uh, let's let's try to make it uh, court and bonder uh, because okay. we don't have much time. Thank you. Okay. Peter Faber, are you still in, going to make a, a, a watchful response? Yes, okay, see. thank you very and much. Then, uh, Peter Faber, then uh, Betri Holes. Chair, just to Honorable Scon's question on the, I think firstly to clarify, the matter on the pension funds is not necessarily, the question is not necessarily when people will indefinitely come back or not. It's I think the concern is whether it's short-term return. So somebody leaves, changes residency, et cetera, for six months and then comes back, et cetera. So it's not whether they will ever, ever come back. I think that was the concern. Um, Honorable George then asks, well, did we make counter proposals? And I think the answer was yes, looking at things like changes in tax residence. I think the point of departure of the discussion was, firstly, what sorts of proposing is very theoretical. I think uh, Beatri made the point to change residence, et cetera, has in itself consequences. Uh, it's not always that easy. Um, and especially if you're changing something like ordinary residence, not just some deemed residence, et cetera. So it's not that easy. It's not very cheap to do so. So people won't willy nilly do this. And we're saying that firstly, this problem seems to be very theoretical. We don't anticipate this to be a legitimate thing that will happen in practice where people will just exit to take their money. And the whole question here is preventing people getting access to their pension funds. Um, once again, people won't just create non-residents to access their pension funds. This clearly can't be a norm that we are anticipating. It, it, it surely in our mind is a bit of a theoretical answer to this. And I think that's why we're saying there are current tax tests for this. We don't need to go to the nth degree. Um, and once again, the risks, et cetera, that we're talking about are totally superseded by the additional obligation we are seeking to impose. Then on the matter of, of the, the criminal matter that um, Honorable Kusan also raised, and I think he uses the word sinister motive, and that's the correct word, is that the current wording requires willful intent, whereas he puts it sinister motive. So to differentiate between the person who just accidentally forgot versus the person who actually is seeking to frustrate SARS with sinister motive. The latter is currently in the law called willful intent. So if you with willful intent, don't do this, we will slap you with a criminal sanction. And it is that sinister motive that SARS are looking to delete so that you cannot actually now separate the people with sinister motive from the people who just forgot, like the current law requires. And it again speaks to two, the two matters we raised. One is let's clear up the criminal offenses to limit it to certain things. And if they are repeat, let's look at a repeat offender type of offense or sinister motive test. The second is the selective prosecution thing. So once we get into 
where we are now sure that if the people, two people have sinister motive and they are creating a tax offense, we're back to then SARS should not have a discretion. There should be an objective test to say, well, SARS must prosecute both of those people. We've raised this before in Parliament on the addresses. I think the SARS res officials response at that stage, well, we haven't prosecuted anybody for not changing the address. And that's exactly the problem. It means that SARS officials, not even the MPA, are choosing willy-nilly with no objective test as to who they choose and on what basis they are choosing not to prosecute people. So let's get the offenses right to make sure we are just criminalizing the right things. But secondly, once we've agreed what those things are and that they are a burden on society, let's then make sure there's an objective test to put to SARS so that we are criminalizing and compelling them to prosecute people for criminal offenses. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, better goals. Thank you, Honourable Chair. I'm just trying to uh, get my video to work. On the on the matter of um, the Honourable Skosana's questions regarding specifically uh, retiring retiring um, abroad and how do we ensure that the person doesn't come back? Short answer is we can't. Um, there's no test or current way unless you put a clawback provision in place to make sure that people who took money and left don't come back. And across the world, it is a tendency for people to, to go abroad and work abroad and then want to at some point come home and retire. We all want to come home and, and uh, I think for, for a lot of us, retire in the place that we grew up. So. The question then becomes, if we can't ensure that they don't come back, how do we ensure that the process that we follow to make sure that they can get their money from a retirement fund is rigorous? And the current process that we have is rigorous because of the exchange control limitations that's attached to that. So Saab's process is very rigorous. There's a lot of questions that need to be asked. And only once that process is completed, is it accepted that the person shows sufficient intent and has proven sufficiently that they are of the intention to immigrate. And permanently, permanently in our life means for the foreseeable future based on everything being the same. So if we equate that to what our current proposition is, is from side side, we're saying, if a person ceases to be a South African tax resident, that should be sufficient for the person to be able to access. So what that means is if a person moves abroad and that person's center, exactly like my colleague from Cyprus said, if that person's center of vital interest, if the home is still in South Africa, et cetera, et cetera, that person will still remain a South African tax resident. And I know from having dealt with SARS and worked there for years, there's no way SARS will accept a person saying, I'm not a South African tax resident, taxable on my worldwide income, unless they are very sure that the person has in fact moved their center of vital interest and they are now in fact tax resident abroad. Whether that be via the, the physical presence test, via DTA, via moving or their ordinary residence abroad. So putting this in terms of in, in SARS's court, with regard to legislation, they have interpreted and applied for years, determining whether a person should pay tax in South Africa or not on worldwide income or on source income if you're a non-resident, means that we can use everything that we currently have in the structure and just have a very rigorous test with regards to that. I do agree with my colleague from SAPA, it would be necessary to make sure that what we currently have in terms of when you submit your uh, tax return, that you state that, that that process must then be interrogated and so forth so that it is um, more rigorous than it currently is in the sense that you have more records. But other than that, the process already exists. And I think sufficiently so that SARS would not accept it without having made doubly sure that the person is in fact very serious. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Betri. Alan, from your side, are there members who want to make comments and uh, ask questions? Uh, no more, Chairperson, not just yet. 
Okay. Um, let's move to the minerals industry. We'll start with the minerals concern. Are you there? Minerals Council, are they connected, Alan? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Are you from the Minerals Council? Yes, that's correct. Good morning, Honorable Chair. My name is Ursula Brown. I represent the Minerals Council of South Africa which is a, a mining advoc advocacy um, industry association, which represents the interests of the majority of mining companies in the country. Um, Chair, the issue, uh, if I can just ask Alan to put our presentation up. Um, okay, you know you have got 10 minutes here. Yeah. I understand so, Chair, thank you. Um, okay. In the interest of time, I'll go straight to the issue, which is on page five of the presentation. Um, the issue that we want to address this morning relates to the proposed amendments to section, sections 15 and 36 of the Income Tax Act, Chair, which seeks to limit the deduction of accelerated capital expenditure allowances only to um, um, mining taxpayers who hold mining rights as defined in terms of the NPRDA. Um, on the next slide, um, we indicate Chair, that this will have a significant impact on contractor miners who forms an essential part of the mining um, industry as they will clearly be precluded from, from um, claiming this um, capital expenditure allowance. But not only that, Chair, in addition to that, they will also be precluded from claiming the capital expenditure allowances under sections 12C and um, 11E of the Income Tax Act, as these sections specifically prohibits the deduction of expenditure um, incurred where the taxpayer's trade is mining. And our view is that this will leave the contractor miners in the untenable position that they will not be able to claim um, these um, capital, these accelerated capital expenditure allowances in terms of any of the other provisions of the Income Tax Act. On the next slide, um, we also indicate that this proposed amendment will not only have an impact on, on contractor miners, but also a number of, un, of other um, 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 taxpayers who undertake mining activities but are not holders of mining rights. So there is a huge risk of, a, of significant adverse unintended consequences for other taxpayers. And as an example here, we um, point out that um, parties who um, participate in unincorporated JVs where they pool and share um, the assets, um, they might be um, negatively impacted as well as um, um, arrangements where a party holds a mining lease and not a mining right. Um, um, their, their rights in those instances will also be adversely impacted. Uh, this, this will have a significant impact on current BE structures because in these instances, they're predominantly structured um, on, in the form of unincorporated JVs. Um, and um, obviously they will be excluded from, from claiming um, um, these um, allowances. On the next slide, Chair, we uh, looked at what it is um, that what is the harm that Treasury um, intends to cure um, through this proposed amendment? And from the statement, it's indicated that they, they need to consider whether both a contract miner that excavates minerals for a fee and a mineral right holder should qualify for accelerated capital expenditure incurred by them in terms of these two provisions. We don't understand the rationale um, for for, for um, the justification because what is clearly happening here is that uh, one needs to look at the activities because only the person who actually incur the expenditure would be able to qualify and claim the capital allowance. So there is no risk um, of um, double deductions um, to, to the fiscus 
in the sense that the same capital expenditure will be claimed by um, two different parties. Um, and, and it is therefore not clear what is the mischief that Treasury wants to address through the um, implementation of this proposed um, amendment. On the next slide, we just broadly look at the role and the contribution of contractor miners. And as already pointed out, um, we believe they form an essential part of the South African mining industry. Um, they play a critical role. Um, and in many instances, you know, they're responsible for sig um, significant capital outlays, especially in relation to junior miners, as an example. Who do not have sufficient capital or expenditure to con sorry or expertise um, to conduct the, the, the mining activities. And in, it is in this sphere that they predominantly rely on, on, on contractor miners um, to, to assist with um, the starting up um, and the construction of, of mining operations from an early stage and right through, um, in many instances, the life cycle of, of, the, of the mine. Um, excluding um, co um, co contractor miners from claiming this benefit on the next slide, um, we indicate will have uh, the potential impact of destabilizing the entire mining industry, um, because this will clearly um, you know, discourage further investment into the country which in turn will have a negative impact on employment, uh, which in turn will have a, uh, an impact on the overall competitive, on competitive, competitiveness um, of the mining industry. Um, and uh, we indicate in sure that this is, this is an issue that we need to guard strongly against, um, especially now given the current economic circumstances in which we're operating. Um, and the need to actually promote and encourage further um, economic growth um, in the country. On the last slide, I touch on our recommendations, Chair, and um, our view is that it is that Treasury need to reconsider the appropriateness of the amendments, specifically given the impact of um, reducing relief for businesses. Um, and especially given the fact that there is no mischief on the part of the taxpayers. Um, in light of this, we would like to recommend that the proposed amendments to section 15 and 636 should not be implemented. Um, if it is a case that Treasury needs to understand in, uh, on a more granular basis, you know, how contractor um, um, miners operate and what contribution it is um, that they bring to the industry. We recommend, Chair, that the process uh, or the consideration for implementing any uh, changes to legislation be delayed until such time as Treasury has embarked on broad consultations with the mining industry um, to obtain greater clarity on, on these issues. Um, and use that information to inform an, an, uh, to, to inform an appropriate basis on which uh, any decisions um, for changes to this legislation um, should be made. Uh, we appeal to, to Treasury you know, um, to, to not be hasty, um, but rather given the significant impact on the industry, um, pay care consideration consideration um, to how changes to le legislation um, is affected. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Brown from uh, Minerals Council. The next presentation comes from uh, International Zinc Association. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Simon Norton from the International Zinc Association based in Cape Town. I look after the affairs of the International Association, Zinc Association for South Africa and Africa. Um, if you will allow me just to briefly introduce the industry as follows. Can uh, everybody see my presentation? Yes, we can see your slides. 
Um, I just want to briefly introduce you to um, zinc and the important role it plays in the South African economy. Um, it's an essential material that's used both in heavy industry and the steel industry to protect materials from corrosion. It's also used as an additive to fertilizers for grain and other crops. And it's utilized extensively in multivitamins, vitamin, um, health supplements, in suntan lotions, and in all sorts of other applications, such as uh, vulcanizing of tires and the manufacturing of tires. Um, it's a healthy material. <clears throat> it's recycled all over the place throughout the world and particularly in South Africa. And in that recycling process, it eventually ends up as scrap. And that's the basis of our submission later on. South Africa hosts about 20% of the world's zinc deposits, yet we no longer refine zinc into its refined form. <clears throat> we have an established secondary zinc and die casting industry. And it's about that that I'll come to in a short while. From 2014 to 2019, we imported about 15 billion rands worth of refined zinc because we no longer refine it. Uh, until 2011, we manufactured our own refined zinc to the tune of about 110,000 metric tons per annum, worth about 4.3 billion. Our zinc usage has dropped from 86,000 tons in 2015 to 59,000 tons in 2019. Uh, we generate significant tonnages of zinc scrap. Largely, zinc is used for galvanizing of steel and it provides long lasting corrosion protection. I don't expect the committee to actually deal with all the technical issues I've put up here, but the three key ones in the middle are it provides a barrier, it provides an electric or cathodic protection, and it gives a beautiful color to the material. It then ensures that the steel in, say, infrastructure projects, railways, waterworks, wastewater works, lasts for an extended period and he's almost free of maintenance. So it's an enormously valuable material, but eventually it ends up as scrap. Um, zinc is also used in coating of steel sheets. So lots of roofing on buildings is actually zinc coated sheet. And when that comes off, eventually it ends up as scrap. And if you look in the photographs I'm showing you here, you can see that zinc is used in motor car, automotive manufacture. It's used for reinforcing steel. It's used on railway carriage manufacture in, in vessels in the marine industry and also in wind turbines. If you look at this graph, and this is what I'm going to be briefly talking about in our submission to the committee, on the left hand axis, you see the product premium. In other words, the price you can achieve for a material and then the value added. The bottom left hand block shows SHG, that's special high grade uh, refined zinc. The next level galvanized alloys is even worth even more. And finally, die cast alloys, uh, alloys is worth even more. And the South African die casting industry needs scrap zinc. And that's why I've showed the slide to show that you get huge added value out of die casting. And there's a contribution to that from, from zinc. Um, furthermore, in galvanizing, there is a material generated during the process, which I'll talk about shortly. And this just gives you some idea of the beauty of zinc and the way in which it's used. All the steel work in the background is, is zinc galvanized. A lot of the material you'll see on this particular visual um, is galvanized steel. When it comes to the end of its life, it then becomes scrap. Now, our, our actual submission is as follows. The International <coughs> Zinc Association supports and promotes the use of zinc, and we're working very actively to promote and support the use of zinc in South Africa and in Africa. And we're very concerned about the fact that a number of secondary zinc industries in South Africa could be starved of their essential raw material from scrap material. Um, and in particular, we'd like to comment on the 2020 draft taxation laws amendment bill. We, if you just have a look here, you'll see that we promote and support the sustainable use of zinc in a wide range of applications. And this is on your should be on your submission, which I sent through to Alan. But to give you some idea, it's in medicine and cosmetics, tire manufacturing, health supplements and lozenges, fertilizers for grains and crops. Zinc is incorporated into what are known as non ferrous metal alloys, including brass, phosphor bronze and zinc die casting alloys. <clears throat> In South Africa, we have 28 hot tip galvanizers. These are plants in Cape Town, Durban, Port Elizabeth, Gauteng, in fact, all over the country. 
And they essentially take steel, dip it into molten zinc. It gets coated, it then gets either painted or sent directly out for railway pylons, electrical pylons from ESCOM and municipalities, buildings, structures. And during that galvanizing process, they, those plants create what's known as ash and dross. This is very rich in zinc. And that ash and dross goes into the scrap recycling system. And you will then understand why I'm referring to it. The non-ferrous metal scrap can include copper and copper alloys, and I won't fight for their industry. They're going to present to you later. Aluminium and aluminium alloys, they've also made a presentation. And then it's us, zinc and zinc alloys. I've also mentioned lead from tungsten and tungsten alloys from very specialized metal alloys and titanium and titanium alloys. Now, though those three non-ferrous metals are not within the direct ambit of the Zinc Association, there is a project being run by the Department of Science and Technology on light metals and titanium and titanium alloys would be included in that. So I've raised it because it's material to the table, which is in the um, draft tax laws amendment bill. <clears throat> I've already um, shown you this, but again, just to emphasize the point that zinc is a healthy material and it's utilized in all sorts of applications, fertilizers, corrosion protection, steel protection, um, tires, um, cosmetics, etc. This is the industry that we would like to uh, protect and look after in particular the aluminium gentleman will speak about that or the aluminium federation but we're interested in looking after the zinc pressure dye casting industry and other industries that will use scrap zinc <clears throat> um, in your submission i just put in a brief note about the enormous value of tungsten merely because it came up in conversations that i had with people in the zinc industry the secondary industry the downstream secondary industry and people involved with non-ferrous metals. But turning to the table that the Treasury has proposed, you will see that against item 193.02, they refer to, sorry, 193.00, they refer to just ferrous waste and scrap. We'd like to um, insert next to 193.03, instead of other waste and scrap, the words non-ferrous um, metals in that table, and then under 193.03.01, where it refers to turning, shavings, chips, milling, etc., we'd like to put in the words galvanizing dross and galvanizing ash, because these are rich in zinc. Then under the section below that, where it says um, rem other remelting scrap ingots, copper waste and scrap, aluminium waste and scrap, We'd like to add, or we would propose to add other categories, namely zinc and zinc alloy waste and scrap, titanium and titanium alloy waste and scrap, lead scrap, including lead from used batteries, tungsten and tungsten alloy waste scrap. The reason I'm putting in the titanium is obviously because the, the Department of Science and Technology has got a light metals project and that came up in our conversations. What also came up in our conversations that when zinc is refined here in South Africa and in neighboring states such as Zambia, um, electrodes are manufactured from lead and lead is a huge amount of lead is, in, is, is included in used batteries. Then we have to say that we, we, because we had a limited time to actually devise and reflect on the proposed amendments to the act, we spoke to players in the secondary industry and we suggesting that under the categories we've mentioned above, but particularly zinc and zinc alloy waste and scrap, that the tariff item be set at 3000 rands per kilogram for the general, the categories general, European Union and Mercosur. And it was also proposed by people in the zinc industry that there be some review of the prices so that they don't, the tariffs don't fall behind the, the trends in the in in the international non-ferrous metals market. And finally, um, I'd like to thank the committee for allowing us this opportunity from the International Zinc Association uh, to present to you. And the photographs here show some of the components that can be managed manufactured by zinc die casting and by other zinc applications, where secondary zinc scrap is actually utilised. 
And this is an enormously valuable material, which I understand from my predecessor was actually exported in enormous quantities from South Africa. At the moment, as far as we're aware, about 4 million kilograms are leaving the country. But we still got to do some more research work on to find out exactly what's leaving and where it actually goes to. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Simon, from uh, the International Zinc Association for your presentation. Uh, the next presentation will come from uh, Asala Mittal. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, honorable members, and uh, all participants on this call. My name is Colin Houts. I am the Chief Marketing Officer of ArcelorMittal South Africa, the largest steel maker in South Africa. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our position with regards to the draft uh, TLAB and very specifically the proposed export taxes on ferrous scrap. Uh, in brief, ArcelorMittal South Africa disagrees in principle with the proposed export tax on ferrous scrap. Uh, and this opinion is based on, on four fundamental reasons. The first is that there is more than adequate scrap supply in South Africa to meet local demand. Such a tax would distort and dampen the domestic scrap prices. And the benefits of this will not flow to the economy in general, but rather will accrue in, in a very small select interest group, namely the electric steel makers. Secondly, a decrease in the local scrap price would dampen the incentive to uh, collect scrap, negatively impacting the manufacturing sector in general, but more importantly, the uh, informal sector in particular. Thirdly, the proposed tax would not be beneficial to the downstream scrap suppliers, the manufacturing sector, uh, who should be the beneficiaries of an intervention. And even though, fourthly, even though ArcelorMittal would enjoy some benefit directly from lower scrap prices, we are, if not the largest, the second largest scrap consumer in the country. Um, we believe it will have a disproportionate effect on steel product producers that are based on iron ore, such as ArcelorMittal. And we believe the longer term impact on the steel industry would be negative. I'm gonna take these points in more detail one by one. Firstly, the, the point on there is adequate scrap supply in South Africa. Um, South Africa has had industrial scale steel production since 1934 and has accumulated a scrap reservoir that can be reasonably estimated to be around 140 million tons. And this scrap reservoir is growing roughly 2 million tons per year. There's about 4 million tons of steel or steel products entering the country and about 2.5 million tons of steel making, consuming the steel, the scrap. Um, South Africa has some of the lowest scrap prices in the world. The Southeast Asian scrap price is normally taken as a reference globally. And South Africa is already 75 to $80 per ton below that Southeast Asian scrap price. We know that there are complaints of a lack of scrap in the country, but we believe this is an indication that the scrap prices in South Africa are actually too low to motivate the collection and sorting of scrap. And if at the present levels, the pricing is insufficient to incentivize, incentivize scrap collection, then the answer cannot be to implement a tax which reduces the scrap price domestically further and thereby disincentivizing collection further. It should also be noted that uh, 2018 was a very profitable year globally for the steel industry with the difference between the scrap price and the price for long steel products giving significant uh, profits. Uh, and as such, the reported difficulties of South Africa's electric steel makers to be profitable during this period seems more likely to be linked to the structural overcapacity of steel making in the country rather than the price paid for the scrap. Uh, as a final point on scrap availability, the highest quality scrap the prompt scrap comes from the manufacturing process. And it is generated when manufacturing transforms fresh steel into uh, products. And it is then the leftovers, the scrap pieces. 
the volume of pump scrap is therefore dependent on the activity of the manufacturing sector. And so to have more pump scrap, South Africa actually needs to motivate more manufacturing to generate more of the economy demand. Uh, and so protection of downstream industries would be more supportive of the uh, steel and scrap industries than implementing an, a tax on, uh, an export tax on ferrous. Um, scrap. The local scrap price uh, reduction would disincentivize collection. The informal scrap collection sector, the main source of what we call brown scrap, will be paid less for the material they bring to scrap merchants. There'll be a reduction in the already very small take-home pay of this sector. Um, with lower realized prices and lower volumes being processed, the scale and efficiency of scrap collection will be lost. And so this, this part of the economy will shrink. Um, thirdly, the proposed tax is not beneficial to the people that create scrap and supply it, the manufacturing sector. And in effect, it is a disproportionate and direct subsidy to electric steel makers and thereby distorting the, the market. Um, there is structural overcapacity of steel making in South Africa. Um, of course, a lower scrap price will benefit electric steel making. South Africa will suffer in general. The export tax is proposed at a thousand rands a ton, which can be seen almost as a subsidy directly to those mini mills. Uh, while this will allow short term increased production, the longer term effect will be more serious uh, and could uh, result in the closure of plants uh, for example, we could lose the ability to beneficiate iron ore in South Africa. Um, certainly, that would uh, mean the closure of high-end, high-quality steels, which can only be made from iron ore. Uh, these steels are crucial for the automotive sector, the mining sector, and high-value exports. So without domestic production based on iron ore, um, companies dependent on these products will be forced to either downsize or close. And finally, the wire producers who depend on wire rod from ArcelorMittal will also be forced to either reduce significantly or close. So the, the distortive effect of this proposed tax would mean that uh, the investments in the iron ore supply chain uh, could be constrained and could lead to further job losses. Also, the, the scale of the tax at a thousand rand is disproportionate to what we've seen as the effect of the preferential pricing system in the, in the past. The PPS had a net effect over years of about 45 rand a ton, ranging between plus and minus 200 rand a ton. Um, so at a thousand rands, the proposed tax seems disproportionate. And if the tax is ultimately uh, implemented, then we would at least suggest uh, that it should not be in the thousand rand range, but that it should be in the 50 rand per ton range uh, as, as a calculated value. So in summary, there's four reasons. We have enough scrap in South Africa. We will disincentivize collection further. Uh, this will be uh, hurtful to the informal sector that collects steel. It will also be hurtful to the manufacturing sector who sell back the scrap to offset the price of the initial steel that they paid. And even though ArcelorMittal would enjoy some benefit from lower scrap prices, it would have a disproportionate effect in the market, hurting the longer term uh, steel industry in South Africa. This doesn't take away from the fact that there are issues in the steel sector in South Africa. There is structural overcapacity. That's why Minister Patel is working on the steel master plan. Um, this proposed tax would be a disproportionate subsidy to the electric steel makers to the detriment of the integrated steel route and uh, distort the market. So as a final point, if we are to put export taxes on raw materials, um, there are more raw materials to consider, such as iron ore, such as coking coal. They can all, or ferrochrome, to, to go outside of our own uh, uh, direct interest. Those natural uh, resources should then all receive a similar protection in form of an export tax. Uh, so it's, it's either all or 
uh, or not do this at all. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. And if there are any questions, uh, I'm also open for those. Uh, thank you, Colin from uh, Assam Mittal for your presentation. The next presentation will come from uh, Copa Development Association Africa. Good morning, Honourable Chairman, members. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to highlight some salient points um, to our written submission. Um, it's not our intention to repeat the contents of the submission, but we'd just like to highlight certain areas which are of concern. Um, we fully support the implementation of a tax on the export of scrap, um, which we believe will secure more scrap for the use by our main major manufacturing members who use recycled copper in their production processes. There are, however, some important issues which should be considered in the curbing of export scrap. Number one uh, would be VAT. VAT is being manipulated uh, during the, the collection process, um, which at the end of the day is costing uh, government money. Number two, um, copper scrap is being melted into bullets, ingots, and blocks. Um, there are various names for, for those particular uh, proportions. Now that's done to bypass the scrap export export per permit system because there is no tax on ingots or bullets. Now we believe that that should be included in the export scrap system. And number three, um, we believe that the export of scrap is an ideal money laundering opportunity with its negative impact on the country. Uh, our concern is, as well is that the demand for copper is growing internationally, mainly because of renewable energy, energy such as wind turbines, uh, photovoltaic. It's going to increase. Now, as the demand for, for copper increases, so will the demand for scrap. Um, it's our belief that the demand for scrap in South Africa is causing the theft of copper cable. And we all know what, uh, what the consequences of cable theft is. Um, and we believe that the, if the copper scrap uh, export uh, tax is implemented, then that would perhaps curb some of the export of the, of the copper scrap and we are sure we will see a um, reduction in the uh, amount of cable theft, which is devastating the infrastructure in South Africa. Honourable Chairman, members, that's all we would like to add to our official written submission. Um, and I hope by making this our particular presentation so short, we'll, you will be able to make up some of the time lost during this meeting. To yourselves, thank you very much. Um, uh, very kind of you, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Copper Development Association Africa for your presentation. Uh, the next presentation will come from, is it Co? How, how do you pronounce it, South Africa? Uh, Alan, how do you Jim, pronounce no, it? So the next one is the uh, MRA, which is the Metal Recyclers Association of South Africa. MRA. That's correct. What happened? Uh, let me see. Oh yeah. Okay. Metals Recyclers Association of South Africa. Are you ready? Uh, I am chair. I'm Donald Mackay. Um, could we perhaps get my presentation up, which which I believe Alan would have? Uh, I seem to be unable to share my screen, so I'm not sure if that's my fault. Otherwise, we can just talk. Ah, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Donald Mackay from XA International Trade Advisors. We're an international trade consulting firm, and we are the advisors to the MRA. 
I'm joined with uh, Bernard Maguire and Mike Wilson from the MRA, uh, both of them on the executive, um, as well as um, two gentlemen with many, many years experience in the, in the recycling industry. Um, just a quick introduction to the MRA. They have 80 members with uh, 130 licensed facilities. Um, if we just go, sorry, just, oh, uh, yep. With 130 licensed facilities processing between three to 4 million tons of recycled metal a year, uh, 10,000 direct employees within their membership base, um, but also supporting 300,000 informal suppliers uh, these would be the, the, the scrap collectors. Um, if we go to the next slide, which deals with where does scrap metal originate? Um, so we really have four primary sources of, of scrap metal. We have around 300,000 informal scrap collectors, as we mentioned. And this is really the end of life metal um, that has been discarded by the, by the um, consumer of a, of a beverage or whatever it might be. Uh, we have the manufacturing sector, which is producing a higher quality form of scrap, which, uh, which Colin has already described. So a company that's working with steel or with aluminium, uh, the leftover bits becomes part of the, the scrap stream. Uh, construction sector, when things like buildings are, are taken down, um, and even in the process of construction, uh, and then state-owned enterprises. In fact, Transnet is the, the, the largest generator of scrap steel. Um, and so state-owned enterprises and, and you know, government in general is also a generator of, of scrap. Um, moving to the next slide, we've got 70 common products which are converted from the waste stream to downstream raw materials. And I think what's important here, this conversion process takes an item that is truly waste and of, of no value, um, and it turns it into something that has some commercial value to the downstream consuming industry. But there's an enormous variation in value. Um, by example, one of the cheaper, um, one of the cheapest steel scrap items would be steel shavings, uh, costing around 1,800 Rand a ton. Uh, to bright shiny copper at 105,000 rand a ton. So certainly a huge variation in value between the different products. Um, so where does the scrap metal get used? Well, it goes into foundries, into mini mills and, and, and mills, and it gets exported. Um, so most of the foundries are inland. And, and not just foundries, the mini mills, the mills, et cetera, are inland. Uh, but the scrap, of course, is collected from all over the country. We've had a system known as the price preference system for the last few years, which has essentially inserted a discount into the price that you need to, you need to sell your scrap for before you can um, get an export permit. So in other words, you either have to make it available locally at a discount and it, only if, if you either can't close a deal like that, um, can you then be issued with an, with an export permit. So this discount, which, which Colin in fact referred to as, as a subsidy to the industry has resulted in a proliferation of minimals. And many of those would not be profitable under normal circumstances. In other words, if you took away the, the legally uh, enforced discounting structure, many of those mini mills would not be profitable. And the subsidy is what keeps them going. And we can see this it just in, in it has been roughly a doubling in the number of these uh, mini mills that have occurred uh, since PPS was, was put into place. Um, if we look at steel exports, so the top slide, and I apologize, the slide is a little bit busy with, with the, the, the two bar charts. Um, the, top, the top chart is the volume exported. So if we have a look at the, the horizontal orange line, that is the moment that PPS was implemented. Um, I'm not suggesting that the full fall off in the exports is directly due to PPS because we are producing less. Our manufacturing sector has been distressed for a while and are consequently generating less, um, less value. But there's been a really significant fall off in the exports. 
if you look at the chart at the bottom, this chart is showing the value of those exports. And so if you look at the 2011-2012 the, the period, and by the way, we've rolled this into 12-month rolling periods because August's data from SARS is the most recent data available. So we were exporting 4.3 billion, 5.5 billion Rand a year. That's dropped down to less than 2 billion Rand a year. And the value difference between that, what, is, what has happened to all of that steel? Um, well, that is in, in large part flowed into the domestic consuming industry at a discount. Now, of course, the domestic consuming industry is, is not getting the product free of charge. So the discount is not the, the full value of whatever that difference is. But, but the, 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 that, value, that value that has disappeared out of exports has gone somewhere. And we're going we're gonna to just take a moment to talk about that. So if we look at the scrap metal value chain, we have, we have four sources, primary sources of scrap metal, which I've described a little bit earlier. But then in the middle, we have the scrap recycling industry, and, and they serve an incredibly important function because they take this waste material and they convert it into something that has economic value. So whether it, it be taking a, a car that has been written off um, and breaking it down into its component parts, sorting it into the various types of material, uh, shredding the metal to make it usable by the foundry or the minimal. Um, we could not be in a position where a car that is written off is, is just delivered to the, the minimal uh, to process. So that, that intermediate industry is incredibly important. If we look at the, the, the foundries and minimals, which is really the domestic consumption of the scrap steel, which doesn't get exported, uh, any transfer of value that we give to them has to come from some way. So the idea that what we can do is, is just continuously depreciate the value of this raw material they use uh, means that somebody is covering that, covering that cost. It is not coming at no cost at all. And it is coming out of the recycling sector and it is coming out of the sources of scrap metal. So the factory that generates scrap, some of that scrap there will no longer be a market for. And if we look at uh, perhaps the, the, the most vulnerable of this whole group, the, the collectors of scrap, um, they are the hardest hit. So what we're sitting with is a transfer of value uh, from scrap collectors to foundries, mills, and mini mills. Um, on to the next slide, and this one gets a little bit busy again with the proposed duties. Uh, to be very clear, the MRA is not opposed to an export duty. The reason the MRA is not opposed to an export duty is the alternatives are just considerably worse. So we, we, we don't want to be in a position where a ban is put in place. The, the, the ban had fairly significant impacts on, on uh, this particular market, and we'll show those numbers in a moment. We don't want to be in a position with an instrument like PPS which is uh, a little bit of a nightmare to deal with. So it, it's difficult to work with. It's, there's a lot of unpredictability. If we're going to see investment in the sector, um, a reasonable compromise would be to insert a duty. But the duty needs to be an ad valorem duty, not a fixed duty. Um, this, would, this would in part address the concerns of the gentleman earlier from the Zinc Association wanting the, the duties to be addressed uh, on a really regular basis. Um, but an ad valorem duty would, would allow there to be predictability and it would not have the effect of taking certain products out of the market because they, they, they be simply are not viable. If we have a look at the period the ban was in place, um, what happened? You know, roughly the scrap metal prices dropped by, by something like 10% in that period. Um, however, at the same time, the, the, the companies creating product out of that scrap stream uh, all put their prices up. So the, the, the consumer did not benefit from making this raw material cheaper. 
uh, all that happened is that the profit was transferred to the companies that consume the scrap. The examples where we, we've given just due to time constraints have been related to steel. Um, we, the, the steel sector seems to be the one pushing the hardest for, for protection in this format. And so we focused our attention on steel, but of course, uh, if required, we can, we can certainly provide whatever information you would need on, on any, of the other, any of the other sectors. If we take for a moment uh, to just quickly deviate from steel, what has happened to the value? Well, before the export ban was put in place, on average, a, a, a scrap collector would be, paying nine, would be paid nine rand a kilogram for a, re, for a beverage can, a used beverage can. During the export ban, if they could sell it at all, which in some cases they couldn't, they were getting three rand a kilogram. And you have to collect 70, seven zero cans, uh, used beverage cans, in order to make up one kilogram. So very quickly, if you're a scrap collector and you are not really close to the recycling facility, uh, then collecting cans will not happen. And when that situation arises, uh, what happens to that product? Those products end up in a landfill or they end up as litter in the neighborhood, but they, they lose their economic value because it's not enough to say, well, he still earns three rand a kilogram. He has to make a calculation if it is worth making that collection, incurring the cost to get it to the recycler. Um, and so there are fairly severe implications that have to be considered. And the export duty is certainly a better solution to this, but it is just to demonstrate the implications of what happens when, uh, when these duties or constraints to the export market are, are, are not carefully watched. So we're giving again just one example here because this particular example it deals with steel again like like i said earlier the most sensitive item um so this this slide is really busy so let me walk everyone through what you are what you are looking at so to the left you see two blocks and uh, that is the cheapest scrap steel available this is a mixed steel shavings uh, and to hold, the right, excuse hold, me. Hold. Uh, you are left with three minutes. I've given you enough time to make a presentation. If you can go towards uh, your recommendation. Yeah, we're, we're, this is our last slide, Chair. I apologize. Okay. We have, if you, if you take a look at the, the, the table on the left, you will see that the, the export costs to get the product to an export consumer um, with the 10% duty, which is what we are proposing on steel, uh, would account for 55% of the CIF cost of the, the product. If we impose an export tax at 1,000 Rand per ton, those export costs as a percentage of CIF value would get to 101%. When you're over 100%, you can't sell the product any longer. And those same values, that 55% or on the right-hand side, that 26.5%, um, those would effectively be the discounts that a domestic consumer would get on the product. So just to be very clear, if, the, if we deal with a fixed tax, some of the cheaper uh, products will simply fall out of the waste stream, will not have economic value, and will end up in a landfill. And that's not a good outcome. And an, an, uh, an ad valorem, a percentage-based duty, would still provide some protection for the consuming industry, um, but would allow the generators of scrap and the recyclers st to still have feasible businesses at the end of this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Donald, from the Metal Recyclers Association of uh, South Africa. The next presentation comes from uh, SCORE South Africa. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this, uh, to make a presentation. Uh, I do have a, um, 
a presentation to go on the screen. I don't know if I can share my screen or if it's going to be coming up. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, Score Metals. Uh, I'm Deron Barnes, the CEO of Score Metals, and uh, as well as the uh, chairman of the Electric Steelmakers Association. And this presentation will be representing SCORE as well as uh, uh, the other electric steel makers uh, in South Africa. Um, we've heard a lot of comments from uh, my colleague, both the, uh, from AMSA and from the uh, Metal Resources Association, which I'll try and get to some of those towards the end of my presentation. But first and foremost, let me discuss uh, uh, the issues of ferrous scrap, and I'm referring to ferrous scrap, that's steel scrap, which is uh, uh, used by the steel mills to um, used by the steel mills to to produce steel. Uh, SCORE and the rest of the electric steel makers are very much in support of this export tax on scrap, and it will go a long way in supporting the steel industry. In 2012, the government uh, introduced a price preference system to limit the export of scrap. This put in certain discounts, as Donald uh, from XA uh, mentioned earlier, to uh, limit the export of scrap and reduce the price of scrap in South Africa for the local steel producers. The proposed export tax is a similar but much more decisive measure that will fulfill the intention to limit the export of ferrous scrap. The question that we have to ask ourselves here is why is there a need for exporting for, to limit the export of ferrous scrap? And there definitely is a need. My colleague from AMSA mentioned there's an abundance of uh, scrap in South Africa and there is no need to limit the export of scrap. Just on that point, uh, AMSA, if everyone <coughs> would remember, closed all the electric arc furnaces at Funderbaal Park a number of years ago. These electric arc furnaces use steel scrap to produce flat products. They close them, they don't produce them, they've shut that, and the entire steel industry today is without flat products. Now, if AMSA was producing using those electric arc furnaces, they wouldn't be having issues relating to the current lack of production of flat products in South Africa. So, Remember that we, we as South Africans, uh, we're a developing country down here, and we need to create sustainable and permanent jobs in South Africa and, and prevent the deindustrialization de of South Africa, which is exactly what AMSA did. They closed their arc furnaces for a number of reasons. One of those reasons was because it, a scrap pricing is more expensive was more expensive than iron ore in producing steel. Now, if we have an abundance of scrap in South Africa and we put an export tax on scrap, uh, my colleague from, uh, from AMSA could potentially restart his arc furnaces in Thunderbell Park and produce steel for South Africa that we are so desperately in need of. That is a as opposed to what AMSA has done is put applied to government and to ITAC for an additional 8% safeguard duty on flat products. And AMSA is the only producer of flat products in South Africa. So here we give AMSA an opportunity to get a subsidy, we call it a subsidy, a, 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 a extra discount on their raw material and start up, re-industrialize South Africa and start up their arc furnaces in Thunderbell to support downstream products, but as opposed to that, what we look at is we put an import duty, an additional import duty on finished products. And that creates a whole lot of negative effects on the downstream industry. The South African steel industry as a whole is facing huge problems. It's, on the, on, on, it's, almost, it's almost collapsing, and it has been for the last couple of years. There's a number of reasons. We all know the complaints that we have as South African steel producers in South Africa. We have high electricity costs. We have forced electricity usage reductions because of load shedding, or we get load shedded. We have expensive logistics costs of raw materials and the rail and the ports of our raw materials coming in. 
We have high relative labor costs relative to the production that we all make as steel producers. Uh, we have a reducing demand in South Africa. A demand is reduced by 15 to 20 percent over the last three years. Number of reasons for that. There's a number of reasons for that. We have reduced, and this is important, we have a reduced export volume as a result of duties being imposed on South African, specifically on South African products, into America on South African steel. We have a 25% export duty that our American customers have to pay on Southern produced steel. In Australia, they've been recently, they've been put, put, put duty of 27% on our ropes going into Australia. We've also had a dump in our wire rod of over 50% uh, of all South African rod going into the USA. So we have a reducing demand and increasing costs, which give us competitive, uh, significant competitive cost disadvantages. What South Africa what we need is South African steel producers is some kind of a competitive advantage. We are faced with a number of problems. Today we had strikes all over the country preventing us from working some of our steel plants. We need some kind of a competitive advantage and the competitive advantage that we are looking for here is a competitive advantage that should not cost the South African consumer more to buy our steel products. Because if we charge our South African consumers of steel products more, what we land up doing is we land up having imported steel products, imported primary and imported secondary steel products. This, uh, we spoke a little bit about, um, I, I spoke earlier about uh, import duties increasing costs. Now, this is the first type of a tax that will actually result in a should result in a reduction in the final steel price of primary steel and secondary steel products in South Africa. This will create an additional uh, um, Colin and 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 S, uh, 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 my colleague from uh, XA mentioned that there have been a number of initiatives that have created some additional long steel producers in South Africa. And this particular uh, 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 tax is going to create additional competition in uh, the long steel products in South Africa where there is competition. So, so by reducing the price of scrap and the import price, we will see, and we have seen in the past, uh, a, a reduction in the steel price. And this is a steel price. And when my colleague from XA Metals put on a slide saying there was been an increase in steel price and a reduction in steel scrap prices, we got to always refer to a relative steel price. And the relative steel price is the international steel price times the exchange rate. So these, this is a moving price and it's a relative price to international prices where we have we have a number of competitors in the local uh, long product steel i mentioned some here if just move my presentation down a little bit uh, you'll see uh, cisco uh, score metals kk cisco sa metals unica sa steel mills via steel and fortune steel these are a number of these are all long steel producers in south africa and we've had a number of we have a very competitive long steel pricing sector in South Africa. The export on ferrous scrap will have the effect of giving the steel industry a small competitive advantage that will negate some of the competitive disadvantages that we have, uh, that we have, that I've mentioned about. Areas, areas where there's, uh, uh, where there is competition in South Africa, the steel price is below import parity price. Again, yes, there have been steel price increases and I'll defend those. But if you look at what I've written down here, where there is no, this is very important, where there's no competitors, AMSA is the only producer of flat products. Now, using the same, the same grid steel is produced in the same way, AMSA has plants, one in Thunderbell, Thunderbell producing flat products and Newcastle producing long products. In March this year, for the same steel in SAE 188, hot rolled coil, where there is no competition, AMSA charged a price of 10,200 Rand a ton. It works to the largest customer, which our largest customers, so it's 10,200 Rand a ton. For the same grade of steel in SAE 108, grade wire rod, 
in March this year to their largest customer, their X-Works price is 7.8. That difference is massive. It's the same steel, it's just rolled into a different shape. And why is that? Because there's competition in the long product sectors of the market. And this export tax on scrap will create further competition in the long in, in the entire steel market. If we give if uh, if we give South African business and certainly the South African steel producers certainty that we will limit the export of scrap in a proper manner, and I understand that we have had some limitations of the export of scrap now using the PPS system, but there have been a number of limitations with regards to that uh, in the ability to to control that export of scrap. So the export tax itself will give us a defined number for the for the value of that benefit that the local producers will get and i'm certain that as a result of that we will increase competition increase investment in the upstream sector which will create competition and which will give further competition in the downstream steel uh, steel uh, steel market and that will, that will create significant jobs in the steel in the steel industry. Just to quickly touch on uh, uh, the jobs that were created, uh, that are created in the scrap sector and what this effect, where we believe the effect will be on the scrap sector in South Africa. I don't believe for one minute that there will be a reduction in the amount of scrap collected. There is a thousand, the thousand rand a ton uh, 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 export tax that is proposed we agree with that and we agree with that value what will happen potentially and e potentially in the short term there could be a reduction in the demand in the ability of scrap collectors to collect scrap because the price as donald said may be too low and it might not be worthwhile to collect the scrap but this is incorrect currently with the export ban on scrap in place today our export our current price that the steel mills pay for scrap is more than the price we paid for scrap in March this year. And that is because the demand for scrap exceeds the supply. I'll say that again. The price that we are paying for scrap today with the export ban in place, that means no one can export, is higher than the price we paid in March for, for, for scrap. Now, what has happened in that in the, the situation is that there is more demand for scrap, and as a result of the demand, the price for scrap is pushed up by the mills, which is which is what has happened. If we put the export ban on scrap, more South African steel mills would be using scrap, including ArcelorMittal, if they be, if in their calculations the cost of producing steel using scrap will be cheaper than that of using iron ore. They have the equipment and they have the ability to significantly increase their demand for scrap. And if the price of scrap goes, if, if the demand for scrap goes up, the price of scrap will increase. We don't believe that there's 300,000 jobs in the downstream sector of scrap collection. A 300,000 jobs, I don't know where Donald got that number from, I won't question that. But even, where, even if there are three, 300,000 jobs, in the downstream market, those jobs will still be protected, will still be in place with scrap, with the current scrap price and with the current scrap demand. Uh, just quickly touching on a few things that were said, uh, just uh, for the committee's uh, uh, information, currently our steel price, finished steel price is around 9,000 Rand a ton. Now, Donald mentioned earlier that cans were sold for 9,000 Rand a ton earlier. And now being sold for 3,000 Rand a ton, the, the cans. Now, I, I'm not sure what he was referring to. My finished price of steel is 9,000 Rand a ton. And if those finished product, if those cans were sold for 9,000 Rand a ton, and there's an export tax of 1,000 Rand on those cans, that would not make a difference on that exporting of those cans. Um, Doron, can you conclude? I will conclude. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks very much. We, we as, just as a concluding point, SCORE believes that the export of tax, the export tax on scrap is a very important 
and and very 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 uh, um, uh, it's a primary uh, support that the steel industry currently needs in order to survive. Thank you very much. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Toron from SCO, uh, South Africa. Uh, honorable members, those were the presentations from uh, minerals uh, industry. Uh, questions, comments. Alan, you will assist me in uh, identifying members who will want to speak. Uh, for now, there's no hands um, raised, Chair, and I haven't received anything on WhatsApp or SMS. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Harmin Ace. I'm from Black Mountain Mining. Excuse me, sorry. Just... Sorry. Um, uh, Chairperson, uh, Honorable Abraham has got a question. Okay. Honorable Abraham. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a bit distracted because it's my birthday today, Chair, and you didn't say happy birthday. Oh, we didn't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, no, I'm very <laughs> uh, uh, happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, did not, I did not know. I, I should have acknowledged that right at the beginning when we started with the meeting. Okay, <laughs> so thank you. No problem, no problem. So, no, it was just on a lighter note. So. Okay. Um, so maybe one really needs to appreciate the contributions and and acknowledge indeed that uh, this is what we are about as 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 as, as the committees. Uh, that public participation is highly recommended comes highly recommended and we 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 have we have no we we have no intention really to let people speak and do nothing about it and uh, in all honesty chair the issues that have been raised here vary greatly and we need to have an appreciation of that and not just gloss over them, but have a look at, of course, within the constraints of time, have a look of the possibility because you do not want to present to a, a departments the, the, the thinking of the stakeholders without really looking at the possibility of consideration, you know? And for example, the, 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 there's, 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 there's a mention of a sovereign wealth fund, which has its own implications or for taxation, you know? Uh, but where does that find space in this, in this, in this bill, for example? some expression of it you know and in terms of what has been presented as well there's supposed to be some amendments also made to 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 to, to the money bill and 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 even there there's a particular procedure that needs to be followed when you listen honorable chairperson to the presentations they are genuine but also very complex, you know. Uh, however, the, the, the issues are taken and they need a thorough consideration and study. And also, as we assist our stakeholders to really, to really get 
some uh, presentation within the bill. You know, it's always a, a, an advice that they also consider not only raising uh, challenges that they're facing, but also put up very clear recommendations and recommendations that, they, that, that, that should take into cognizance that, you know, policies are crafted not because of a nice time or, or, or fun, but they are crafted against a need. And therefore, when you make an input, you also need to consider that your recommendation should at the same time not jeopardize the need for that policy. So Chair, for me, not really uh, posing a question, but just saying there are quite a few and deeper things that have been raised here and that need a thorough study and a thorough look at how how best, especially, especially with those uh, presentations that do come up with um, a, a tangible recommendations that will not jeopardize the purpose of the bill. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Honorable Abraham. Uh, we just have to indicate to stakeholders that uh, we take serious the presentations that you are making. Uh, hence, next week when uh, Treasury comes back, uh, they will have to respond and we'll still engage them as to why are they not taking your presentations or your recommendations into considerations. It's just that today it's your platform uh, for you to make uh, presentations uh, without being uh, disturbed. Uh, hence, we ask clarity uh, seeking questions and make comments there and there. But as Parliament, the issues that you are raising, uh, we consider them, uh, we take them in a very, very serious note and uh, we'll consider them when we engage Treasure. Uh, I see there's uh, Murolong. Uh, oh, no, 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 Chairperson, I don't think it is a, a question or a comment. I just wanted to alert you that I, this since this morning, I'm really battling with connectivity. I've been coming in and out of this meeting. Uh, I'd, I'd really like to apologize that uh, I've not been able to fully participate in the discussions that are ensuing. Thanks, Chair. Uko <laughs> says Yes, Chair. Uh, we must redeploy him. Sounds like install a five, I'm rolling. He must be redeployed. No, I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the end of this month, if you want to have a five, but we totally unrestricted, but in unlimited Wi-Fi, it's it's much cheaper than buying yeah. data regularly. Uh -huh. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's like Kosana here in. Uh, Siabuso uh, and Siabuso is next to Swane, Pretoria. I don't understand why he has got problem of connectivity. Hi, people of villages and small towns are they always in trouble. But Malamle is a small town. The whole of Malamle, even in the field, we have got uh, we are a Wi-Fi hotspot. Even when we are looking for cattle, we don't struggle. <laughs> No, thank you very much. Okay. I see there's a hand from Ermin Ace. Hi, uh, yes, good afternoon, Chair. Um, I wasn't sure whether this is the right time to raise. We've also made a presentation and you have included that at the end of the agenda on behalf of Black Mountain Mining. So because it was a mining related representation, I was wondering whether it would be able to raise that in two minutes at this point in time as part of the mining discussion, or when would that be relevant? Okay, wait, uh, Alan, what happened to their presentation? Uh, Jay, you'll notice from the um, oh, agenda that I sent you that the other submissions received, they're not uh, part of the presentations today. We've received a written submission from them and that's been distributed. 
Yes, I mean, we take serious uh, uh, written and oral uh, uh, presentations. Uh, it's just that we can't have space for all uh, 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 submissions to be presented oral. But all those presentations, I mean, submissions like uh, Pro Roof, SA Steel, Evraz, uh, Nefmia, Jets, Cape Gate, Fries Metal, Black Mountain, DRD Gold, APSA, uh, we'll also consider them uh, when we engage uh, uh, Treasure. And as you will be here next week, uh, 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 you will uh, listen to Treasure's uh, response. And they will also respond to those that are there below uh, uh, on the program. So we consider both uh, written and oral uh, submissions uh, equally. There is no submission which is more important than the other submission. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Yes, I hope you will come back next week when Treasurer responds. Yes, no, we will. Thanks very much. You are welcome and thanks for understanding. Uh, let's move to the last category. Uh, is tax consult ready? Uh, Chair, just quickly, I'm not sure if any of the uh, previous six uh, presenters would want to respond to the issues raised by or by or Honorable uh, uh, Abram. Yeah. Okay. Uh, minerals industry, uh, do you want to respond to the respond to the issues raised by Honorable Abram? Yes. From my side, um, I thought it was a statement made by Honorable Abrams. I have no specific responses. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Brown. Uh, it was more of a comment than a, a question. I, I also agree. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, let's move to the last category, uh, text consult. Who's presenting from Tex Consults? Yeah. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm Jean de Toy representing Tax Consulting SA. Um, we wish to address the committee on, on two items, which, which is, as raised by the um, admin ACE, um, I understand have already been addressed by stakeholders in the tax industry, so I'll do my best not to labour the points already made. Uh, because the first relates to the withdrawal of retirement funds upon immigration and the second addresses the, uh, the proposed amendments on minor tax offences. So I'll try and deal with it very quickly. Um, in terms of the first item, I think the point around the, the three-year lock-in period has already been dealt with adequately. So I would just simply echo the sentiment that the three-year lock-in is disproportionate and perhaps arbitrary because there are material tax implications when someone ceases tax residency and this should already serve as a sufficient hurdle for individuals who would consider immigrant immigrating simply to access their retirement benefits and this is not to mention the other costs associated with immigration um, and then something perhaps not completely addressed if we if it is accepted that the three-year lock-in period will be done away with and the retirement benefit can be withdrawn immediately upon ceasing residency. It, it is not clear how this will be addressed, pra assessed practically. Um, and without getting into too much detail, where someone immigrates from South Africa permanently, their residency status will likely have to be determined in terms of the ordinary resident test. Um, and this test by its nature is an exhaustive exercise that involves objectively assessing the taxpayer's full factual matrix to determine if they've left South Africa permanently. And it's inconceivable that SARS would make an objective determination of every person's residency who seeks to withdraw their retirement benefits, because this will be simply too burdensome. So we just need to understand how residency or the, the cessation of residency will be determined and how this, this would have to be proved, especially considering that the onus of proof rests with the with the taxpayer and further to that 
Uh, it may be problematic to allow for the cessation of residency by any means because uh, this would not cater for cases where an individual ceases residency by application of a double tax treaty. Uh, in such a case, a person may cease residency even if they are still considered resident under our domestic tests. And practically, this means that an individual who works in a foreign country for a fixed period would be able to prove non-residency and may then withdraw their retirement benefits even if they have the intention to return to South Africa permanently once their assignment conclude, concludes. So in this case, the concern around a person returning to South Africa after withdrawing their retirement fund may be warranted. Then just as a final point, uh, there is no clarity at this stage on, on the migration to the new system if it is in fact implemented. So. Um, at the moment, we sometimes see the immigration process through the South African Reserve Bank take up to a year. So in many instances, individuals have already initiated the process, but it is quite possible that it will not be finalized by the effective date of 1 March 2021. So we just need clarity on the transitional arrangements and how these cases will be treated. And then on the, the other point that we wanted to discuss, uh, relating to the removal of the element of willfulness from minor tax offences. Uh, I think that the technical aspects around the, the legal requirements have been dealt with more than adequately, so I'll not canvas these items again. Just in terms of the cited purpose of the amendment, we, we note that the National Prosecuting Authority stated that the current wording of the relevant provisions um, undermines their ability to prosecute offenders because they cannot prove the elements of the crime. Um, now, if this is the rationale for the amendment, I think it is important to understand to what degree this problem is factually encountered by the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, in other words, it, it would be helpful to understand how many cases are in fact referred to the NPA by SARS and specifically how many cases that are referred cannot be be pursued because the elements of the crime cannot be proven. Um, I, I think this is an important, it's, it's important to understand this as a backdrop to the discussion and if these statistics could perhaps be shared in response uh, to the session, that would be very helpful. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's it from us from our side. The other um, aspects have been addressed by my predecessors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, tax consult. Eden Vest. Good afternoon. My name is Marissa, um, Honorable Chair, members of the Standing Committee on Finance and other attendees for today's session. Thank you for the opportunity for us to participate in the session today. Like I said, my name is Marissa from Eden Vest. Similar to Smart Funder, we too administer the implementation of the employer provided bursaries to relatives of qualifying employees. We wish to comment on the proposed removal of the element of the salary sacrifice for purposes of these bursaries. As we have heard from other presenters today, and as we have realized over the past few months, our country has suffered tremendously as a result of the COVID pandemic. The aftermath has been severe and had a devastating impact on not only our country and its economy as a whole, but also on employers, employees, and basically on all members of our society. Countless employers were forced to close their operations, resulting in enormous job losses, which in turn had a tremendous effect on our already shocking unemployment. Some of the employers who have been fortunate to survive the first half of 2020 have implemented salary cuts and even retrenchments. And many of these employers will take years to recover if they are indeed able to recover at all. As for employees, most were not spared the brunt of the pandemic either. I'm going to share my screen now and um, can everybody see my screen? It should be coming up shortly. There we go. So we at Invest, um, 
would like to comment on the draft taxation administration's um, bill. And if we start, I would like to first look at the salary sacrifice element. Um, and let's do this because then you'll um, see it a little bit better. There we go. As we know, salary sacrifice as a component of the exemption for bursaries to employees creates an opportunity for both employers and employees to address the skill shortage in South Africa in a time where our economy needs it the most. Not only does this address the skill shortage in our country, it also allows for employers to play a positive role in promoting both basic and tertiary education within South Africa. The proposed amendment of removing the salary sacrifice element will not only be detrimental to employers and employees, but unfortunately education in our country will suffer the most. While it has been said over and over again that government wants to do as much as possible to promote and uplift education in our country, and that they want to contribute to the skills shortage, removal of the element of salary sacrifice in Section 101Q might in fact be seen as the exact opposite of what government wants to do. With movements such as fees must fall, it's understandable that we cannot oblige fully with all of these requests for free education to all. It's not possible. But government can, however, contribute and they can do their part for education and upliftment of skills shortage by not amending Section 101Q with these proposed amendments. Let's just quickly go to the next slide. There we go. So it's a well known fact that bursaries, as contained in the Act, went nearly unnoticed since its inception. After the inclusion of the salary sacrifice element during 2006, employers were still not capable of implementing the benefit themselves, which could potentially be attributed to, to perhaps their lack of knowledge and expertise when it comes to the interpretation of the Act or perhaps they didn't have the resources to actually implement this. Implementing the benefit in a compliant manner requires not only extensive knowledge and expertise of the Act, it also requires an administrative burden which employers simply do not have capacity for. As described in interpretation note number 66, which was released by SARS during 2012, they highlighted some guidelines and they gave a few examples of how the bursaries could possibly be implemented. Unfortunately, the interpretation note lacked clear and concise compliance rules and requirements. As we will see on the next slide, available tax statistics to date shows negligible numbers reflecting the use of the bursaries and it attests to the fact that the employers were not equipped or perhaps they were unsure on how, on how to implement the bursaries themselves. So if we look at the available tax statistics, I've just made a little summary there from the information that is available um, on the um, SARS website. 2003, um, you can see the numbers there, it goes up, um, goes up again, then it drops, goes up. If we look at 2013, now remember this was after the release of the salary sacrifice element in 2006. 2013, it dropped significantly. And the latest tax statistics that are available for 2018 actually drops even further. That's quite interesting. So in the past three years, service providers have established models to implement the benefit on behalf of employers, and they've been able to do so in a way that it does not have any financial impact on the employer. Because having no financial impact on the employer was absolutely vital to establish a model where we could implement the bursary for employers. As we all know, employers have for a very long time 
they still are, and they will continue in the foresee foreseeable future to be under severe financial strains. The result of service providers offering the implementation of the bursary to employers was that qualifying employees were now able to both participate in government's initiatives to uplift education and to address the skills shortage in the country. Having the bursary being implemented by way of a salary sacrifice resulted in the employee, have, in the employee having a more favorable PAYE contribution as a direct result of them contributing towards educating a relative. Restructuring, as we know, of an employee's remuneration in such a way that it has the most favorable PAYE liability for the employee has always been allowed to be done as long as it is done in accordance with the, the regulations as laid down by SARS. So as I mentioned, service providers took it upon themselves to research and to refine a method in which the employer provided bursaries could be implemented according to the available legislative constraints. And these were, as Francois from Smart Funder mentioned earlier this morning, if you go back in the amendment bills as far back from 2006 to 2017, where the thresholds were increased and the amounts of the tax exempt portions of the bursaries were described. There was also the SARS interpretation note of 2012, and it highlighted a few items of how bursaries could be implemented. Obviously, currently as it stands, this bursary is available for employees that earn um, that that earned less than six hundred thousand rand in the prior tax year. It also describes the maximum tax exempt portions for the different bursaries being basic or tertiary. Um, the, the interpretation note also says that the studies must be done at a recognized learning institute. And this I must just quickly say, this is where the service providers have also been very, very fundamental because um, they check if the school or the tertiary education provider, service provider, actually is a recognized this service provider. I just want to highlight one other thing that was listed on interpretation. Uh, sorry. Uh, a direct payment of fees, for example, to a university for the purpose of an employee's studies <laughs> in the ambit of a bona fide scholarship or bursary. So unfortunately, the reality is that there are service providers and employers who are abusing this particular section in the Act. And this is what we need to address. Before we continue and see what our suggestions are, I would like to, say, to share some interesting, some interesting facts with you that perhaps you are aware of or perhaps you are not aware of. So did you know, um, recent stats data shows that almost two in every 10 potential learners are not able to attend a school or a tertiary institution due to lack of funds. Also very interesting to note, as at 2019, the estimated cost of educating a child at basic education is 130 rand and 50 cents per day. So if you compare that to the um, minimum wage, I think you'll have a little bit of a, a little bit of a wake up call. Also interesting to note that um, remember it's not only the school fees that form part of the, ex um, the expenses to send a child to school. There's a lot of other categories of expenses that you need to keep in mind, like uniform, transport, accommodation, all kinds of other items. Another very interesting um, fact is that 40,1% of South Africa's 20.4 million young people between the ages of 15 to 34 are not employed. They're not in any educational training. And I think this is something that we must maybe just pause and think about before we change 
um, this section in the Act to take away the salary sacrifice element. Um, just also another interesting fact, which you might not know, tertiary attainment within our country is the lowest across all OECD and partner countries in the world, with the majority of the population having an upper secondary or post-secondary non-tertiary qualification as their highest level of education. I must also note tertiary qualifications are less common in South Africa. Only 7% of adults have a tertiary education, which is also unfortunately the lowest among all the OECD and partner countries. On the next slide, um, did you know that one for every 100 national tertiary students in South Africa, four of these students are unfortunately enrolled abroad? A shocking fact that I also recently discovered According to UNICEF, only 22% of South African children could read at the appropriate grade level. How shocking is that? Having said all of this, I would also just like to highlight some of the key goals of the NDP, which they want to realize by 2030. They want to ensure that there's universal access to one phase of early childhood development. They would like to improve South Africa's standing in international comparative standardized tests. They want to eradicate all infrastructure backlogs by that same year. And that they also want to ensure that all schools are funded at the minimum per learner levels determined nationally, and that funds are utilized transparently and effectively. So in closing, we also say that amendments to the Act is not only crucial, it's absolutely necessary to address the abuse which currently exists. I'm saying address the abuse. There is absolutely no reason why all compliant employees who are currently or who, who could potentially be utilizing this wonderful benefit, which by the way, stimulates, uplifts and promotes education in our country, why should we punish them by removing the salary sacrifice element? I say yes, I say close that loophole, regulate a compliant way in which the bursary can be implemented. So yes, in a nutshell, we need to amend section 101Q so that we can eliminate the abuse by service providers and employers, but also in a way that we can allow government to participate and to actually lead the way in both skills upliftment and in contributing to education in our country. So I think there's a lot of clever people out there and they can give many more brilliant suggestions than what we can, but perhaps you can look at something like um, enforce the inclusion of valid compliance elements. Tell us exactly what you want to be included as part of a regulative legislation and we can do that. Maybe include a salary restructuring option where employees are able to continue paying these expenses, but they need to prove this. Um, lastly, maybe if you really want to change it, perhaps just give us, give our South African people just a little bit of time to recover after this devastating COVID. Um, maybe perhaps only implement this in three years. Ladies and gents, I would like to, if I may, just leave you with the late Nelson Mandela, just with this, this saying, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. I would like, like to say thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Standing Committee. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to participate today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marisa. Uh, the next presentation comes from uh, Solidarity. Good afternoon. Honourable members of the Standing Committee, Honourable Chairperson, thank you very much for this opportunity to address you today. My name is Marius Krokom. I'm from the Trade Union Solidarity. We represent over 200,000 members and in particular pertaining to this discussion, 28,000 members in the metal and engineering industry. Uh, I'm going to address you verbally on the scrap, the scrap metal export duties that's proposed. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not going to go into a very technical uh, presentation. I think the previous speakers have done so in quite detail around this industry. But I think it's very important to note the following, that the metal industry in South Africa is in severe distress. Uh, scrap metal is a significant resource for inputs into smelters and into the secondary industry. There is a significant shortage of scrap in South Africa. Future growth uh, of the industry is very important. And if should that happen, the shortage of scrap will just get worse. And it will be too late to act on this issue later on in next year or the year after. I think the damage by then would be done. It's also important to note that the first draft of the steel industry master plan was released this week to uh, role players for comment. And it echoed exactly these sentiments that I've expressed to you around the industry uh, situation. Uh, I just also want to re-emphasize that the Minister of the Department of Trade and Industry banned export for a few months. The result was that the availability of good ex uh, scrap metal increased with a price decrease. And that, I think, emphasizes the role that illegal or massive exports of scrap played. We believe that the export duty will assist the local industry. It will help protect jobs, which is very dear to our hearts as a trade union. And it will boost the sustainability of manufacturers and producers. Uh, solidarity support, the first principle of export duties on scrap metal, provided that these duties that are collected are somehow ring fenced and brought back to the industry. And we refer, for example, to mechanisms like the Steel Industry Development Fund. Uh, the duty mechanism should also be subjected to regular review to enable the mechanism to match current market conditions or movements in South Africa. So in short summary, uh, we believe the duty is a balance. It's a balance because it does not uh, enforce a total ban on, on scrap export, but brings in a duty that will benefit local manufacturers and we believe protect jobs but also enable the merchants and other, other dealers in scrap to continue with their business. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Alan, what happened to the chairperson? Uh, it looks like he's offline. He probably lost connection. Uh, but if you can maybe just ask the next presenter to um, avail us of. OK. Who is the next presenter, uh, Alan? Uh, next present. Mama Kola. Yes, yes. Uh, from Bowman's. Okay, thank you so much. You can take I'll, the stage, ma'am. I'll You're project welcome. the presentation from my side. Um, well, good afternoon, honorable members of the committee and to the chair. Hopefully he'll reconnect. And good afternoon to all the other members of the public and industry who have presented here. Um, my name is Mokola Makola. I'm a partner at Bowman's. Um, a law firm. Uh, I work at the office in Johannesburg. Um, I come to you not only as a lawyer, but also as a citizen who is a mother, an aunt, and um, um, a very interest, interested party. Quite a few of the amend amendments that were proposed. I do, as you'll see, the presentation that is up on the screen relates to the proposed amendments to section 46 who are relating to unbundling transactions. But there is another amendment that I have a vested interest in, um, as I said, as a citizen of this country, and that is um, the proposed amendment to section 101Q. I don't want to spend too much time um, belaboring the points that have already been made in, res in respect of that particular amendment, save to just say, look, we, I would, I would urge all of us to just think about the impact that this, um, this amendment in, as currently drafted will have on the you know the efforts that the country has really been putting in, in into making um quality education um accessible to to the general public of south africa 
but also just thinking about the fact that you know by providing quality by providing quality education to the, um, the South African public, we are creating taxpayers of the future. So um, I would ask that we not shoot us, shoot ourselves in the foot um, by you know making it difficult for for employers to provide this benefit to their employees. Um, you know there is um, you know there, there, there is a benefit for the country to be realised if um, we all have access to quality education. It does increase prof prospects of employment and there will be a way to recover the tax, um, at least generate more tax revenue. Um, it's no secret that the tax base in South Africa is quite small um, and SARS has uh, spoken um, at length about the need to widen um, the, the tax base. Um, it's not enough to just focus on um, avoidance schemes and perceived avoidance schemes. Uh, you know, the country does need to create um, quality jobs that will generate the, the, the kind of revenue that the country sorely needs now more than ever. Thank you. And now I will get started um, with regards to, to the proposed amendments to section 46 um, dealing with unbundling transactions. Um, as you'll see, I think I'm, I'm the old one out here. I only have one slide. Um, I, as soon as I was told that we only had 10 minutes, I thought one slide, which is um, the high level points that we want to make uh, would be sufficient. And I'm very grateful to my to the other speakers who've already spoken um, um, on these proposed amendments. Um, I just want to, uh, can I just ask that it ex be expanded a little bit? Um, my answer is not the best, even though I'm sitting close to um, Alan. Alan? Alan? Can we is enlarge? Can we, can we, can we, Sorry, my connection also failed. Uh, just say again, what did you ask? I just want to enlarge the slide. Um, my eyesight is not the best, even with glasses on. Sorry. Uh, that's much better. So, you know, the, the, this submission is being made in light of further discussions that we had with National Treasury, um, for, for which we were very grateful. Um, we we're given an opportunity to express further our views and, and to have a fruitful en engagement with National Treasury. And there were certain um, sort of proposals that were made um, during that discussion on the 23rd of September. Um, in, in which, you know, relating to the possible, the possibility of an introduction of a pro rating and also the willingness to consider at least um, a de minimis um, rule um, in respect of the application of the section. But, uh, you know, the high level comments that I would like to make is, you know, we, I, I, I do, we do believe that we need to really um, uh, you know, take some time to sufficiently consider the impact that this kind of amendment will have on the South African economy. Um, an economy that relies heavily on foreign direct investment. Um, and if, you know, it, it is, it's no secret that investors um, do look at all sorts of um, considerations when they consider making an investment in any jurisdiction, including the tax regime. And this particular um, amendment as currently drafted is a concern to us because we see it as uh, having the potential to um, to, to, be a, to act as a disincentive to foreign direct investment. If investors know that a company may not necessarily, South African company will not be able to unbundle, you know, because unbundling is proven to be an expensive exercise for the company to engage in, they, they may reconsider. I think it's important to appreciate that, you know, when a company unbundles, it doesn't do so for tax reasons. It's, it, it does so in order to, um, to, to unlock value for its own shareholders. So if companies find it uh, find that it's um, it's it, it, it proves to be that an, an unbundling is an expensive exercise to engage in, um, and therefore is a, there's a, it's not they're not incentivized to do so. Um, you know, investors are unlikely to find South African companies um, an attractive um, investment option. And you know, with a, in a country like ours, which um, which has a very high unemployment rate, I think this is the last thing that we we need as a country. We want um, companies to 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 be incentivized to to you know to unbundle, and but more importantly, we want um, investors to see our our jurisdiction as an attractive um, um, investment jurisdiction. And along with that, it's also the concern that we have about the category of um, disqualified persons as defined in the section. 
Um, we understand that there is no appetite to pay down that definition and exclude certain of the entities um, that are included in that category, namely pension funds and Section 37A at trusts and, and, and MPBOs. We would re request that a consideration be given to so, um, paring down that category because in, in particular with um, retirement funds. South Africa has, um, you, know, you know, struggles with saving, particularly retirement saving, and we need to do our utmost to encourage South African citizens to, um, in, to, to save for their retirement. Um, you know, the, the burden on the state, uh, you know, it, it, it is quite heavy. Um, the, it, the state can't, it's not sustainable for the, you know, for, for the country to be, to be paying um, pension funds, pensions to, to its citizens in their old age. And we need to do more to help our citizens to, 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 to save. And unfortunately, an, amendments of, uh, an amendment of this nature, which again, makes it, uh, it, it, makes it difficult for um, retirement funds to, to invest in listed companies does have an impact, particularly if you keep in mind that um, upon exiting um, a, a retirement fund, there is tax that is payable um, you know, by, by, by the member of the retirement fund. So again, we would urge that consideration be given to just having another look at that definition of disqualified persons. We think there's a merit in, in doing so. Um, as we know, the GPF in, you know, is quite a large investor in, on, on the listed um, on, on listed companies on the stock exchange through um, it's the, through the PIC. Um, but it's not the only look. That's not the only retirement fund. But um, again, it's just to urge um, our colleagues at National Treasury to to, um, to just give some consideration to that request. Um, with regards to the submissions, do the um, proposals that were made in, at the meeting of the 23rd of September. Uh, we we would request um, you know a, a bit more detail from our colleagues at National Treasury on how um, they see the de minimis rule applying and what the threshold will be. That's assuming that there is appetite to the introduction of that. Um, we understood that they would be looking into that. Um, you know, there's also clarity that we would need um, that we are requesting. Um, and, you know, this is a concern that for you know for many companies in the listed market. You know, where the structure they, they have um, corporate shareholders. Um, there is a view that the, you know the legislation could make it clearer that um, in making an assessment um, or determining whether or not the the exclusion in, in that subsection is, is applicable, where does one where does the analysis stop? Um, is it at the level of the unbundling company or and its immediate shareholders, or do we look um, all the way up the chain? So this is just um, for certainty, as we know, certainty in, in, in tax is um, is desirable. So we are making that request to our colleagues at National Treasury to, to just keep that in mind uh, as they refine their, their, their amendments. Um, and then we, you know, we just need to also make a submission with regards to the pro rating. Um, as we know, in the absence of section 46, um, you know, a, 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 a distribution in specie is taxable in the hands of the, um, the company that makes the distribution. There's capital gains tax and also dividends tax. Now, what we would want to understand is how this pro rating would apply. Uh, but, you know, is it the company that will bear the liability for 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 the tax? Um, in respect of that portion that is considered to not qualify for the relief or not, uh, bearing in mind that if the company does uh, become it does uh, become liable for the tax um, in respect of that transaction, it's actually the other shareholders as well indirectly that bear the the liability for the tax. They um, you know because in you know in, in the absence of um, of this amendment, the, the distribution would have just been tax free, and uh, but now the companies have to actually um, fund the tax liability in some way. So all shareholders get affected, even though it's actually the category of disqualified persons that are, um, that have given uh, uh, rise to the tax liability. Um, and as you'll see, our point is that you know while the pro rating is, seems to be a comfortable, um, a sort of a, an attractive compromise, we actually um, don't think it, it you know it, it, it ultimately it would be of assistance um, and address the concerns that have been raised. Um, and we are also requesting um, we have a request or a submission in respect of the effective date of the amendment. In particular, um, we noted um, in the draft bill that um, the proposed amendment, the intention is to, for it to apply with effect from the 31st of July. We do have a concern with that. 
you know, the, an amendment of this nature has quite a serious impact, not only on the economy, but on how and this uncertainty that is created in, um, in the economy, companies are sort of at a loss as to what to do going forward. Um, I know some, some of my some colleagues have uh, made reference to existing transactions that have been in the pipeline, but it's just, um, you know, in addition to that, I think it's important just to bear in mind that you know, this is a um, like you know the, 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 like the, this uh, amendment has uh, quite a serious. It will have a serious impact, as we say. It may actually lead to um, to unbundlings becoming um, being an, an, an no op not being an option for companies to consider uh, going forward. So we would request clarity. Firstly, um, ideally we would want um, if um, national tragedy is still minded to, to go ahead with the with the amendment. Um, perhaps it should be made to apply with effect from the 1st of January 2021 instead of um, the 31st of July. But also more importantly, it, it's you know we would request that clarity be provided in you know as to how because you know just given the fact that it, it, the reality on the ground is that there's usually a lag of months between the time that the board of a company takes the decision to unbundle and the date on which the, the, the actual unbundling actually happens. And in that interim period, a lot can happen. Um, you, the, you know, ch changing the shareholding in, in the shareholder split in, in in a particular company. So these are the practicalities that we think will be encountered um, going forward. And, and 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 if the amendment were to come into effect with immediately, uh, well, with with effect from the thirty first of July. So we would request that it, um, this be reconsidered. At the very least, um, perhaps it could be made effective from the first of July um, of January twenty twenty one, but no, no, not not earlier. Um, it, it's just you know we, we, look, we do need the companies do need to to, to do business um, and they are and the boards of those companies are accountable to their shareholders and they need to be able to make decisions and I think with something like this with a it feels like an axe hanging over their heads um, I would um, really request that um, our colleagues at National Treasury consider moving the date uh, slightly but uh, having said that I think ultimately our view is that. Um, Perhaps um, this amendment could be withdrawn um, and, 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 and a lot more time taken um, to actually consider the impact that it will have. It wouldn't be the first time that something that that kind of decision was made. Uh, we are, I mean, we know that with the proposed amendments to legislate to the taxation of um, collective investment schemes, the National Treasury did actually withdraw the amendments to take time to consult with the industry and there have been documents that have been prepared. So this would not be an unusual step for national treasury to take to take so that um, you know to just to give um, both um, SARS and national treasury and companies to just give, give consideration to how best um, this uh, provision should be applied. And I think I will leave it there, Chair, and, and thank you again for the opportunity. It's a great honor to be able to speak um, to you and with, uh, amongst the colleagues that are on, 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 in, in the meeting. And um, yeah, I, I really can't say much more than what has been said by my other colleagues and what's on, on, the, on, on the slide that we provided. There is a detailed document that we've all, we had also prepared, which I've shared with, um, with, with uh, Mr. Uh, Wickham. Um, and I, I appreciate the fact that it will be read and um, by, by the committee, and then you can see like the more detailed um, nuances that are, and proposals that we've made in that document. Thank you again for the for for, for your time. You are welcome, uh, Makula from Bowman's. The next uh, presentation comes from uh, SA Petroleum Industry Association. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members of the Standing Committee on Finance, and good afternoon also to the other participants in this um, uh, in this engagement. Uh, my name is Kevin Bart. I'm head of strategic projects at um, South African Petroleum Ind Industry Association, and I'd like to appraise the um, Standing Committee on Finance on on the comments which we made to National Treasury in, for, in terms of the T-Lab. Uh, a little bit of background to this is that um, National Treasury has, has acknowledged over a number of years that pass-through in price regulated uh, sectors is required. Uh, it's applicable in electricity, 
and it should also be applicable uh, for petroleum products. Because as many of you know, the uh, petroleum product industry in, in South Africa is largely price regulated. That includes petrol, illuminating paraffin, uh, diesel, and liquefied petroleum gas. Now, if I can go to the presentation. About SAPIA, you can read that. The association plays a strategic role, and we represent the collective interests of the South African petroleum industry, and as well as promoting the industry's environmental and socio-economic progress. SAPIA fulfills its roles by contributing to the development of regulation in certain areas of South African policy, and engaging with key stakeholders, sharing research information, and providing expert uh, advice and communicating the industry's views to government, members of the public, and the media. If we can go to the next slide. Our position is that the currently formulated pass-through mechanism, uh, which is presented in the T-Lab, is in fact inadequate and will undermine South Africa's refinery sector. The consequence thereof will be reduced jobs, reduced investments, further deindustrialization, and increased co uh, country risk significantly impacting on the balance of payments. Uh, with respect to pass-through, we've engaged with National Treasury over a number of years on this, and they said that that uh, provision would be made in the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill regarding pass-through. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of, the pre of this presentation is obviously to present our, our position, uh, outline our comments to the T-Lab, uh, provide a high-level impact of the current proposal on the, on the oil refining industry, that's a crude oil refining industry. Uh, we note Sapir's obligation and then we conclude. Our position is that pass-through must apply to all price control products. As mentioned before, petrol, diesel, illuminating paraffin and LPG are all price controlled. And, and it must apply to 100% of the carbon tax applicable on these products. Pass-through is not a punishment tool to be used to reduce emissions of local refineries. And without an adequate pass-through on these products, local manufacturing will not be able to compete against imports. The consequence is that local production will decline and eventually cease being replaced by imports. That will have a significant impact in terms of refineries, security supply of petroleum products, and of course, jobs. Next slide, please. The rationale for this is that imported product does not attract a carbon tax as carbon pricing is not incorporated into these petroleum products. For information, uh, refiners, when they plan production, they plan production also largely based on the possibility of import of petroleum products. And if they, and if they can import petroleum products cheaper than what it costs to produce, it's rational for them to actually import these products. So thus, import an imported product not attracting carbon tax, as opposed to locally produced products, which does, can severely impact locally produced uh, products. This will raise the loss of the local cost of production without doing the same for imports and is obviously prejudicial to refining and will result in the eventual demise of the local sector. As previously mentioned, products are subject to price control by the DMRE, DMRE the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, and consequently, Consequently, there's not a free market for these products that will see the carbon tax being passed through to the consumer. Under, under normal carbon tax theory, the imposition of a carbon tax by, by the authorities would, will, will, be placed on, will be placed on the products which are sold to the consumer and hence passed through. That is obviously not possible within a price regulated environment. Thus, the carbon tax is prejudicial to local refinery to local refining with no net benefit for CO2 reduction on a global scale. It only serves to undermine local refining at the expense of, of imports. And it rather displaces CO2 emissions from fuels manufacturing in South Africa to foreign jurisdictions with no net benefit for the planet. 
Next slide, please. Sapir commented to the T-Lab, which was published at the end of July, and, uh, and our concerns were mainly raised to administrative issues related to the use of emission factors and the calorific values of fuels. National Treasury replied to that in, in, in a public engagement uh, in September that they will engage with the Department of Environmental Affairs, uh, Fisheries and Forestry, uh, with respect to how they can address that issue. We also commented on the, uh, to, on the pass through mechanism, which was proposed for price control products, which hereafter will be called PCPs for because it's easier. Noting that the pass through is inadequate and limited. And furthermore, no provision was made for the escalation of the carbon tax recovery mechanism in line with the headline rate of the carbon tax, which in the Act. Is, is provided to increase at CPI plus 2% up until 2030. Next slide, please. The pass-through as proposed in the T-Lab only applies to petrol and has to be extended to other price control products for meaningful application. As I mentioned before, illuminating paraffin, where, this, where a single maximum national retail price is gazetted monthly, LPG, where the maximum retail price for liquefied petroleum gas is also gazetted monthly, as well as a maximum refinery gate price, which, which, which is published. And diesel, there's a publication of a wholesale list price, which is monthly, and diesel is also included in the slate mechanism, and various other margins are in fact controlled by the Department of Mineral uh, Resources and Energy. So in its current form, it in fact does not meet the principles of equity and transparency and is irrational, especially in consideration with the treatment of electricity. A failure to provide pass-through for PCCs, for PCPs, will have major ramifications for the industry. Refiners will be unable to recover costs in a price-controlled environment, threatening their viability. Significant price regulation exists for these products, as mentioned before, and failure to account for these additional costs will destabilize these structures and create significant uncertainty. The consequence will be a significant shift to imports to avoid these costs, providing an additional threat to refining sustainability. The current proposal only, only has a 0.1 centiliter carbon tax recovery for petrol production. Based on 29 um, figures, that is production figures from crude oil refining, not synthetic, please note, and taking into account all the allowances which would be applicable, the carbon tax liability for oil refineries would be of the order of 40 million. On the current proposal, this would only mean a recovery of about 7 million. Now, petrol is normally about 30% of the of production, whereas the total number of price controlled products is about 65 to 70% of production. What that means is that refiners would still be liable for roughly 30% of that 40 million in terms of the Carbon Tax Act. But it would nevertheless mean an irrecoverable loss to refiners of around 21 million rand. If the 0.1 centiliter was applied to all price control products, this would still be inadequate because production of price control products from oil refining was about 15 billion liters, which would mean irrecoverable expenses of 13 million for refiners. And the calculation there is basically 40 times 70 less 15 million, meaning 13 million uh, would be irre irrecoverable. And no business would be able to tolerate sustained irrecoverable expenses on a year-to-year -year basis and expect to survive. This will be exacerbated by legislated tax increases provided uh, in terms of the headline rate, which will normally double by about 2030. For oil refiners operating in such a price regulated environment, the carbon tax recovery as proposed may be the last straw for them. The current proposal is likely to accelerate the closure of local oil refineries uh, because they're under a number of pressures at the moment, certainly above inflationary administered prices, such as water and electricity, 
and the carbon tax over and above this just make these operations uneconomic. It's also worthwhile to point out that the COVID-19 pandemic has led to has, uh, has led to the world being awash with petroleum product, so much so that margins or refining margins uh, at this stage in time are very, very slim, if not negative. Refiners will rather import instead of manufacture to avoid these costs. So sustainability of local refining is at risk. The carbon tax recovery proposal is too small. It does not cover all the price control products and no provision is made for increases in line with the, head, with the headline rate as outlined in the Act. As the carbon tax increases, imports become increasingly favorable to local manufacturers. Refiners will, will then scale back production and then stop altogether. And the impact will be significant, affecting employment, balance of payments, country risk, and associated industries which, which supply um, oil refineries. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Sapir is not oblivious to the challenges faced by climate change. And we certainly have, have a role to play in this. But we submit that the shift to cleaner energy will not be immediate. It may, be, it may well be sudden, but certainly liquid fuels will still have a major role to play going into the future. It is in South Africa's interest to support local refining in this respect. Since it's an important area for employment, it provides security supply of liquid fuels and it provides a significant manufacturing base, as well as being a, um, as well as supplying significant amount of um, high level, um, high IP uh, input into the into such manufacturing. Refiners note do not expect a carbon tax recovery on all emissions but do expect recovery from those emissions which are, which are attributable to price controlled fuels. But nevertheless, National Treasury's treatment of the pass through as a carbon tax recovery is a practical approach to the problem. But as stated throughout this presentation, the treatment needs to apply to all PCPs, LPG, petrol, IP and diesel, that to the extent possible, carbon tax associated with the manufacture of these products is, recoveries, is recovered. What that means is that the 0.1 centiliter should be increased so that, so that the liability arising from price controlled fuels can be fully recovered. This for oil refineries, by way of a high level calculation, would be in the region of 0.15 centiliter to 0.2 centiliter for all price controlled products. In contrast, that for the synthetic fuels industry would be of the order of four to five cents a litre. And furthermore, provision needs to be made for an annual increase in line with the increase of the headline rate of the carbon tax, uh, which is provided for in the Act. And finally, uh, refiners support government efforts to combat climate change and we actively engage with National Treasury and and the Department of Environmental Affairs, Fisheries and Forestry uh, related to the Climate Change Bill. National Treasury has supported the principle of pass-through for price control products. The proposal as, as by National Treasury is rational in the sense that a carbon tax re recovery is made, but it needs to be expanded to all price control products at a level that will, that will recover the carbon tax attributed to these fuels. Provision furthermore needs to be made for annual increases in line with increases in the headline rate. Failure to provide for carbon tax recovery for price control fuels will put refining at risk of, of closure, which will have significant employment impacts, further shrinking the industrial base. It's to be noted that the residual liability on production will still incentivize refiners um, to improve their carbon performance within the ambit of the current act, which allows for a number of allowances, not all of which are fully recovered by oil refiners. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you. Uh, thank you, Petroleum Industry Association.
Uh, the last presentation will be from uh, SA Informal Traders Alliance. Over to you. Oh, I was trying to mute my device here. I was struggling, but I'm fine now. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon to the chairperson and honorable, honorable members of parliament. Thank you oh, for giving me. Oh, Okay, but if you have a problem, leave video because you got it already sound. No. Yeah. I'm fine now. Uh, but what television when you go for eight? But it looks like you got it soundy poor because of the video. Yeah. yeah let me... <laughs> okay. Uh, let me continue. Uh, yeah, it's because I'm using, but I will try. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me clearly. If it looks like, it sounds like the sound is a bit poor. You can switch off the, the video, okay? You, you can uh, mute uh, the, the video. Okay. Yeah, so that uh, think... you have a better quality sound. Okay. Okay, you can you can proceed. Oh, my name is Michael Mokoja. I'm a general secretary of South African Informal Traders Alliance, Saida, well known as Saida. Uh, today I'm I'm speaking to you on behalf of thousands of informal traders, hawkers, spazers, mm. owners, home based operators across all nine provinces in South Africa. Uh, Saita's key mandate is to ensure that the rights of informal traders are protected and to ensure that all policy and law make into account the rights and needs of our constituents. Our motto is nothing about us without us. By this, we mean that government adopts the principle of inclusivity when decisions and actions are taken and adopted. We are making submission in response to the public. Which we believe will negative impact both our sector and corporate attitudes, such as those in New York's that phone with cigarette. Mode. Yeah, I think he's uh, cut off completely. Yeah. Uh, yes, the this system has disconnected. Eh, muna eshu. Osari kwa na. Oh, yani kahu kwa awas nzeke kati lem. I think it's the is a network. Yeah, try off mana. Wano round this around this off mana a better signal. 
I think I'm better now. Yeah, we can proceed. Okay. I don't know when I was catching this. Uh, one of the most highly traded product for our sector, the national lockdown. When sales moved from legitimate informal traders and who sell legal brands to illicit sellers. Trading illicit brands at ex exorbitant price. This causes an um, amicable um, um, sales for their income and livelihood. Our experience during the ban show us that our taking legal products, which will drive up prices, will simply further and entrench the illegal market and make it extremely difficult for informal traders across the country to compete. We have seen this firsthand, the massive shift from legal to, to illicit brands, especially at the beginning of lockdown. When illicit cigarettes were still priced at their normal price, normalized the market prices, which means that any additional taxes on, on legal products will again shift the market to illicit brand. In addition to the taxes on cigarettes, we are also concerned that increasing taxes on the less harmful products will, affect, will effectively close the door to a switch to those products of both informal traders and our many thousands of customers. We are aware that we that the world is moving away from normal cigarettes to products that are less harmful, ensuring that the health of our citizens and the country is a philosophy that we fully endorse. And we have, we have, for, we have for some time been looking at the ways of, uh, of our customers and this less harmful products, including heated tobacco and e cigarettes. Affordably will always be a key issue for informal traders and their customer, but we are in the process of Exploring our way of ensuring customers uh, and benefit from accessing the product. If government is beautiful, that's a human present today. I thank you. Okay. Raluboa Tatem Hoja for presentation, Yalina, from the SA Informal Traders Alliance. Um, honorable members, uh, those are the presentation uh, from the last uh, batch. Uh, comments? Clarity seeking questions. Alan, you will assist me in uh, identifying members who want to make comments and ask questions. Uh, there is currently no one um, indicating uh, any questions. Okay. Uh, so, we can move towards the conclusion. Is there any other item before we close the meeting so that we can make the closing remarks? Okay. Um, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, stakeholders, for participating in the public hearings. And as I've said before, 
uh, we consider both oral and uh, written submissions. Uh, all of them have got uh, equal status. And uh, uh, Treasury, when they respond next week, uh, they will respond to all the submissions. Uh, as we have heard that uh, uh, the tobacco industry has got uh, issues that uh, they are raising. So Treasury will have to respond uh, to those uh, issues. Uh, I think we need an explanation as to maybe from the law enforcement agencies, because the tobacco industry is making a, a valid point that uh, when tobacco was restricted uh, from being sold uh, to smokers, we saw an upsurge of uh, illicit tobacco in the country. It was all over. Uh, how did it come? What, what, what explanation do we get? It comes through uh, which points of entry, uh, through the border gates, uh, through the airports or through the harbors. How? Uh, we, we, we need that explanation so that we're able to convince uh, the industry why as a government uh, are we not uh, taking uh, strong actions against illicit traders? And then at the end, those who are legal traders have to bear the brunt. So there has to be a strong collaboration between uh, SARS and uh, uh, law enforcement agencies to deal with this uh, uh, matter because the industry is quite uh, concern about uh, uh, the increase of uh, illicit uh, tobacco trade. Uh, the issue of uh, pension withdrawal, the three-year lock-in for immigrating pensioners, uh, is a matter that has been raised by quite a number of uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, removing the salary sacrifices element from uh, employer funded bursaries uh, to uh, prevent abuse by some employers. Uh, this seems to be highly uh, contested. Uh, so Treasury will need to uh, respond next week as to what it sought to ratify uh, by this uh, amendment. Uh, what were the loopholes uh, who benefits from these bursaries? And are these benefits inclusive, for instance, of the black uh, missing middle uh, class? Uh, the introduction of the scrap metal tax for exports, uh, some participants uh, support this. Uh, there might be those who are opposed to this. So Treasury will have to uh, respond because uh, 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 there are strong sentiments around this uh, issue of uh, metal tax for exports. Uh, removing the criminal uh, willful conduct test in minor tax offenses. Uh, uh, there is a contestation from those who have, the, who have made the presentations. Uh, in all those issues uh, that Treasury is proposing, uh, there are those who are for and those who are uh, against. So uh, next week when Treasury comes back with responses, you have to give uh, scientific evidence as to if you have to continue with your proposal, uh, why do you do so? So that the public is convinced about uh, the rationale for implementing uh, the measures that you are proposing. Uh, but also, if you take into consideration what stakeholders have actually raised, uh, you also have to explain if uh, there has to be uh, changes as uh, persuaded by uh, uh, stakeholders. So whatever you present, uh, it must be uh, evidence-based. Uh, there should be science, uh, whether for uh, or against 
we say so so that stakeholders should not think that uh, they come to parliament uh, make presentations uh, we listen to them and we don't take serious uh, what they are presenting uh, because this is not a, a workshop uh, this is a parliamentary session where decisions uh, get uh, taken so we're not on a academic uh, exercise uh, we are dealing with serious matters uh, that affect the lives of our people it's about jobs uh, as it was reported yesterday when we were in the meeting uh, with sars and national treasure uh, since lockdown more than two million people have lost jobs and now uh, the number of those who are in, unemployed has gone up uh, tremendously. And uh, if things do not get sorted out, we don't come up with a, a strong recovery uh, plan uh, uh, in regard to rebuilding the economy. Uh, the situation can worsen. As we have heard somebody saying that uh, even those who seem to be still operating, some are just floating. And uh, we don't know by the end of the year if uh, some of the businesses will still be operational. Of course, SARS has got a, a serious pressure because uh, the other time we met them, they were projecting uh, 300 billion rand uh, less of revenue to be collected in the current uh, financial year. So uh, we have to get uh, treasury SARS and uh, business and, and taxpayers in general uh, to work closely in the interest of uh, South Africa. Uh, thanks very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, uh, and uh, also, happy birthday again, uh, honorable uh, Noxi Abram. And, uh, Thank uh, you, sir. <laughs> thanks very much. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, you are welcome. Th thanks very much, our stakeholders. Uh, next week, uh, by the way, when are we meeting next week, Alan, for Treasury to respond? Before uh, the meeting. Okay, that is on Tuesday. Um, I need to confirm the time, but I'm pretty sure it's 9 to um, 12. So if there's any stakeholder interested, um, if they can please let me know, then I'll forward them the link the meeting once it is created okay so stakeholders you have got the email and the contact numbers of uh, alan uh, uh, get in touch with him about uh, next week's uh, uh, response from uh, treasury and uh, i mean on also the engagement from the side of uh, committee members we would like you to be there uh, when as committee we engage treasury and treasury response uh, thanks very much. Uh, the meeting is uh, adjourned till we meet uh, next week, Tuesday. Goodbye. Talk since. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Uku, Pure, now you don't want to be in the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> next no, time, Chair, no, when no, no, computer, Papa. <laughs>